Today is, oh my God, is it actually? No, it's September 6th. Okay. Welcome to this meeting of the Housing and Homelessness Committee. Today is Wednesday, September 6th. Uh, I am joined so far by my colleagues, Councilmember Lee, Councilmember Harris Dawson, Councilmember Rodriguez. Uh, Ms. Morales, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Rahman. Here. Councilmember Blumenfeld. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Present. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Lee. Present. Five members present and a quorum, Madam Chair. Okay, today we have uh, 15 items um, and hopefully not too many discussion items. Uh, item one is the appointment of Belinda Allen to the Affordable Housing Commission. Item two is the appointment of Gerard Gunsberg to the Rent Adjustment Commission. Item three is the 19th Homeless Roadmap Report from the CAO. Item four is an LAHD report about amending loan agreements for supportive housing developments that are owned and managed by the Single Room Occupancy Housing Corporation. And there is a minor correction to make regarding the description of this item, and I'm gonna ask the clerk to read it into the record now. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, there is no CAO report on file for this item. This is today's consideration is only the LAHD report. Thank you. Okay, great. Item five are a CAO and LAHD reports about executing a disposition and development agreement for affordable housing um, at 216 South Avenue 24 in Council District 1, which uh, I believe has now taken eight years from the identification of this lot to getting to this moment today, which is quite a long time. Item six uh, are CAO and LAHD reports about the feasibility of creating a pilot program to house formerly homeless Angelinos in ADUs and creating a financing pilot for ADUs. Item seven is a motion uh, instructing the CLA and the CAO uh, to report back with details and recommendations about a new executive committee that's been created at the county uh, related to the management of homelessness. Um, so this report will ask uh, how this executive committee is gonna function um, and establish a process that will hopefully allow this executive committee to be informed by the policies that are set by the City of Los Angeles and the City Council. Item eight is a motion instructing the CLA, CAO, City Attorney, Bureau of Engineering, and General Services Department to report about a framework uh, for a citywide real estate and site acquisition policy, including information about financing, operations, and maintenance um, for sites that the city may consider purchasing for use as interim housing. I wanted to offer uh, two amendments uh, to this item, but uh, hopefully just keep it on consent um, if possible. And I wanna read those amendments. Uh, instruct the CLA with the assistance of the CAO, City Attorney, Bureau of Engineering, GSD, and other relevant departments to include in their report back the advantages and disadvantages of the city entering into long-term lease agreements and the feasibility of converting interim housing operations to longer-term or permanent housing um, facilities. And uh, two, instruct the CLA with the assistance of the CAO to report back in 30 days regarding how a policy like the one described here will influence the city's ability to meet its bed count goals as outlined in the LA Alliance Settlement Agreement and the cost savings associated with services potentially being provided through that settlement agreement. Item nine is a verbal update from LAHD about the status of the Ellis Act process and relocation of tenants at the Barrington Plaza apartments located in Council District 11. Item 10 is a motion requesting that the city attorney report on how the city is ensuring that tenant protections outlined in state law are being upheld, including first right of refusal, right of return, um, and payment of damages in cases where the Ellis Act is invoked. Item 11 is a motion instructing LASA um, to report about exits from interim housing sites due to violations of participant behavioral agreements, which I think all of us have dealt with at the interim sites in our district. Item 12, our CAO and LHD reports um, for uh, tax-exempt multifamily conduit revenue notes for Grandview Apartments, which is in Council District 1. Item 13 is a verbal update from LASA regarding new data dashboards. Um, item 14 is the sixth status report from the CAO for the homelessness emergency account. And item 15 is a year-end report from the CAO for that 
same account, and that is uh, where our inside safe dollars are being spent. So uh, with that, I want to move to public comment. But uh, before we move to public uh, comment, um, I wanted to invite Council Member Tracy Park from Council District 11, who wants to uh, provide some introductory remarks um, before our discussion of item nine. So uh, Ms. Park, if you want to join us at the table. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Chairwoman Rahman and the committee members for hosting this important conversation today. Um, when the City Council approved my motion relative to the evictions at Barrington Plaza more than two months ago, I shared that the purpose of my motion was to, one, ensure that the rights of tenants are protected and that the letter of the law was being followed every step of the way, and that, two, we create a public reporting platform that prioritizes transparency and accountability. Most importantly, this included regular reports every 30 days from our housing department and city attorney. And while I am thankful that we are receiving this verbal update today, I am also disappointed and frustrated that this was not done within the requested time frame, and I am also frustrated that this report is being given verbally uh, and not in writing. My expectation is that moving forward, this report will both be timely and written, not verbal. This is so that we can have the online public record instructed with this motion with the reports uploaded to the council file so that the tenants, as well as members of the public, can access them. This is what the tenants of Barrington Plaza asked for, and I intend to honor this request. Likewise, LAHD and the city attorney were asked by this committee and the full council to opine on actions the city could take to prevent permanent displacement. Again, we still don't have an answer. And without requested updates, we are unable to chart an alternative course of action. And all the while, the Ellis Act evictions are underway and tenants are still waiting on answers. So with that said, some of my question for the city attorney and housing department include, what is the report of the uh, status of the report from the city attorney? How many tenants have been relocated? How many tenants were given a September 5th move out date? How many tenants were granted an extension beyond September 5th? For those tenants who have moved, where did they relocate to? Have tenants received all benefits and services they are legally entitled to? How have seniors, the disabled, and long-term tenants been accommodated? And has there been a reduction in tenant services since the Ellis Act filing? Now, while my team and I have advocated and actively worked with Barrington Plaza tenants, raised issues with management, and in some cases, secured extensions above and beyond what is legally required, many lives have been upended, people are worried, and they deserve answers. And so for this reason, I expect answers from the Housing Department and our City Attorney in addition to the actions requested of our departments in this motion. Thank you again for having me today. Thank you, Councilmember Park. And um, I agree with those very important questions uh, and agree that they need answers. So I'm hoping that we can get them. Um, let us uh, begin with public comment. Uh, I'm going to take public comment on all items, and I just want to make sure we have our interpreter. Yes, great. Um, and we have Mei Mei Cheng from the city attorney's office, who is going to provide guidance for the public uh, before they give comment. You know what, I'll, I can read it. Thank you, it's fine. sorry. <laughs> All right, members of the public, when it's your turn to speak, you can state your name and which of the agenda items you're gonna speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item, two minutes to speak on two or more items. Um, and if you wanna address the committee on general public comment, you can have one additional minute for a maximum of up to three minutes per person on all agenda items. Uh, we will inform you when time is up. 
Uh, you must be on topic if you're speaking on agenda items, and our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. Um, if you're not speaking on topic, and, or if we can't tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, I will, I will maybe I'll give you a warning, or maybe you will, Ms. Chang. Um, and if you don't get clearly on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. So at this time, I believe we're ready to take public comment, and we can start with um, Angela Trujillo, uh, someone who signed up under the uh, name G, and Glafira Lopez. If any of you are here, if you want to make your way up to the side, Angela Trujillo, G, Glafira Lopez, and Arnold Sachs. Can we have the speakers come on up? Do you need help? Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Angela Trujillo. What? Sorry, speaker, one second. Do you mind pulling the microphone down? Gracias. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Angela Trujillo. Good afternoon. My name is Angela Trujillo. Me gustaría hacer a comentario sobre el 10. Okay, you want to make an, a comment on item 10? Soy residente del Distrito 9. Llevo, I'm the president of District Number 9. Llevo como 15 años viviendo en mi comunidad. For the last 15 years, I've been serving the community. Y vivo en un departamento de control de renta. And I do live in an apartment with a rental control. En los últimos años, el dueño antiguo vendió la propiedad a una compañía. So in the last, uh, lately, uh, the landlord uh, sold the property año, to a company. Y el año pasado me llegó notificación de que mi departamento iba a ser demolido. El, uh, I just received a notice uh, telling me that my department will be demolished. Para crear nuevas viviendas. So they will create new housing. El proceso de mi información ha sido muy confuso. The process has been very confused con muchos papeles que he recibido I have received so many papers documentos de SB8 al igual many que documentos sobre ELIS uh, documents related to the lease el proceso es por eso que estoy de acuerdo que es importante que la ciudad revalúe el proceso de documentación uh, regarding that documentation process. y asegurarse de que los inquilinos como yo sepamos de nuestros derechos. Yeah, I want to make sure that tenants like me, they will know their rights. Cuando el dueño usa la ley ELIS, When it comes to apply the, the law. yo me he informado sobre mis derechos de regresar. Yeah, I'm trying to be informed regarding my rights. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Your, your time has expired. Ya se le acabó el tiempo, señora. Gracias. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. So we have Glafira Lopez, Arnold Sachs, G, and Mike Greenspan. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Glafira Lopez. I'm a community organizer with Strategic Actions for a Justice Economy. And what items are you speaking on today? Oh, I'm uh, speaking on item number 10. Okay, great. You have one minute. Yeah. So I wanted to uh, say that, again, my name is Glafira Lopez, an organizer with SAGE. 
Um, I wanted to say that I strongly support motion number 10. Um, we see in our tenant action clinic, a lot of tenants recently especially come in with Alice Act evictions. Um, and uh, I've been currently working with a tenant that her landlord um, let her know that they want to do uh, repairs in the building and that they would have to evict the tenants in order for them to do those major repairs. A lot of the times tenants aren't informed about their rights, um, which I think is why this, uh, this motion is so important because it's going to provide more guidelines, more of uh, an accountability so that tenants are able to know and be aware of their rights and there's more um, yeah, there's more regulation to it, basically. Um, so thank you again for, for uh, bringing this motion up. And again, I support uh, number 10. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. We have G, Arnold Sachs, Mike Greenspan. I'll call two more names, Quan Kwa and Jackie Fournier. Speaker, what item did you sign, what name did you sign up under? Yes, well we signed up under Goat Puppet Nigger Developer. You were not, actually that, I didn't call that name yet. Oh, you didn't really? Okay. Okay, it's fine, you can go. Oh, go is ahead. it okay? Yeah, it's okay. Ow! Ow! Okay, what do you want to speak on? Uh, Marquise told me to speak on all the items in general okay. comment. You have two minutes and yes. one minute. Go ahead. Yes, and again, if you could put something on that head, it's blinding me, the reflection off of it. <laughs> so... Look at this. Now people care about number nine. All the time, isn't it? Always when it involves wealthy white people. <laughs> then you give a fucking shit about the Ellis Act. Not when they're brown skin, not when they're black. No, you never talk about it. But the council members will come here and go, oh, the Ellis Act's not being fairly done. Only because they're wealthy and white at number nine. And you know what happens, Marquise, right? They're going to get lawyers. Otherwise, they'll just stand here and go, No, no, me mi renta. No tengo nada apartamento. Quiero la Dios, señor Marquise, quiero. And then you go home and have a few and go, Aren't they funny? I'm not going to help them. I'm going to fill my pockets. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> so now we will get into the other shit. See, time runs when you're having fun. But I will just say that I'm very glad that Nithia finally improved her haircut. That's good because you have to look good. Because when you're over the age of 40 and, and you have kids, it's very hard to hold on to your man. Topic, <laughs> yes. Well, who, who told you that? Oh, Fable told me that. <laughs> it yes. doesn't seem to be on an agenda no, item. Could we please move on? My no, I mean, not it's, on the uh, well, it's, it's a what? It's a topic. Well, I mean, lady, lady, madam, attorney, is that what you are? Yes. <laughs> We're trying to get to number 15 and say fuck number 15. Is that on topic? Yes. All right, is that number 12? Is that fuck number 12? Is that on topic? How about fuck number eight? Fuck Sir, number five. That's I'm on topic. Have to warn you, That's perfectly on topic. on topic. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and now we will get to the general public comment. This one, council one more minute. is filled with thieves, FBI targets, scumbags, murderers, alleged murderers. And other kinds of assholes and cocksuckers that roam this building 24-7. And what do we do? We're the ones that are watching the store. Aren't you glad we're here? We're trying to put you on the right path. We're trying to put you on the right track so you can go straight down the line. Chuka 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 chuka. Woo woo! Chuka chuka chuka. So you don't derail. Yes. We don't want you to derail like Mr. Weezer. And that's what we're afraid of, Marquise. You're Weezer 2.0. And we're afraid of you spending three, five, seven years in prison later. And we don't want to see that. We don't want you to raise your kids behind bars. And Tracy doesn't want to see it either. So remember, everybody, I'm calling on of you to stop stealing okay. immediately. Thank stop you. Your Next speaker, please. Arnold Sachs, Mike Greenspan... Juan Qua, Jackie Fournier, I'll call two more, Claudio Motinari and Iris Craig.
Which items are you speaking on and, and your name, please? Uh, my name is Jackie Fournier, item number nine, Barrington Plaza. Great, you have one minute. Did you want an additional minute for public comment? No, I'm good. Okay, Thank go ahead. You. Hi, my name is Jackie Fournier and I'm representing past and current tenants of Barrington Plaza. In the last four months, we have been left to fend for ourselves to overcome wrong information, harassment, intimidation, and discrimination from Douglas Emmett. We have had no help from the mayor's office, from the city of LA, city council, and we feel LAHD has let us down. Hmm. We feel as though they have gone against us with discrimination, with intimidation, and um, and they have allowed our depart our our custom, oops, sorry <laughs> our tenants to go it alone. They're inadequate. They're incompetent and inconsistent with whatever they are doing with us with our extensions. Trust and believe we are going nowhere. We are fighting for our eviction to go against this for renovations. We will not stand for their harassment, intimidation, and discrimination, and lawsuits are following us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. We've called Quan Kwa, Claudio Motinari, Iris Craig, Arnold Sachs, Mike Greenspan. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Iris Craig. Um, I'd like to comment on item 10, please. Okay, you have one minute. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am a policy analyst and researcher with strategic, act uh, strategic Actions for a Just Economy, an organization committed to advancing economic justice for tenants in LA, and we believe the motion is a crucial step towards safeguarding the rights of tenants and ensuring equitable practices within our city. Uh, we support the, council's, the council member's motion to call for a report back on the city's mechanisms to ensure that protections regarding right of first refusal, right of return at original rents, relocation payment, and payments of damages are enforced and communicated to tenants. Unfortunately, through our Tenant Action Clinic, we have seen various tenants coming to our office seeking support on filling out paperwork they have received from their property owner. Oftentimes, tenants are not sure if the paperwork is legitimate and are afraid to sign anything. Uh, we have also seen this as concern with tenants whose buildings will be demolished to build new affordable housing units. Tenants are often or not often are aware of the possibility of their right to return or right to relocation, and there's not enough information available on the process to enforce their rights. Tenants have very little time to... Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your feedback. Next speaker, please. I'll call a couple more names, Herman, Arnold Sachs, Mike Greenspan, Quan Kwa, Claudio Montanari, Mickey, go ahead. Hi, my name is Claudio Montanari. I'm gonna be speaking in item number nine, number 10, and general comments. Okay, you have two minutes and one minute. Okay, so I'm a resident of Barrington Plaza. Four months ago, we got this eviction notice, and basically the way that was handled was incredibly wrong and bad. We've been going through all this harassment. The way that the paperwork was done through LEHD, Douglas Emmett, it, it's just a mess. We, fi I filed for an extension. I'm gonna talk about my personal uh, problems right now. I filed for an extension because I have medical uh, issues. Uh, so we got four months to be out of the, uh, out of the, the, the eviction. I was requesting for a one year extension I send all my medical records to the city, to Douglas Emmett, to Interwest, and I help some of my neighbors also fill out their paperwork for which they did not have any proof that they had medical uh, problems. I was rejected. I found this out last Friday, that I was rejected, although I sent my entire medical record. This was after LEHD sent us an email a person uh, called Emma, saying that we were not required to send any me medical records, any information other than I need my extension for a medical purpose. Now, we got an email from her on Friday saying that, oh, you should have sent a doctor's note. I sent my medical record with all of my issues, and I was denied. One of the neighbors that I helped fill out the paperwork we send nothing for him, and he got a proof. So somebody that sent all the information, all the proof, gets denied because they want a doctor's note when I send them medical records. 
this is the way that has been handled, it's wrong, mm -hmm. it's bad. People that thought they were approved were rushing to move out on Friday to the point that because they were supposed to be out of the building by yesterday, by the 5th, they left half of their furniture in the dumpsters because they couldn't fit it on a truck, on a moving truck, because they were moving. The way that this was handled, it's wrong. You guys need to step it up. LEHD, the housing department, needs to let us know exactly what are the right steps. They tell us one thing, and the next day they're doing something different. Like I said, I have the email chains. I have all of these. If you guys need proofs, I have them. This is not about retrofitting our building with fire sprinklers. This is about remodeling the building so they can increase the rents to three or four times what they are right now. Please don't be blind. Don't let the Ellis Act be used in this way. This is going to be the end of rent control in LA. Please help us. Thank you. Next speaker, please. We have Herman Sachs, Mike Greenspan, Juan Kwa, Mickey, and Red Chief Hunt. What items are you speaking on? Uh, Ms. Chang, I'm going to speak on all motherfucking items and non-agenda public comment. A total of two plus one is three fucking minutes, Ms. Chang. And the reason, because people want to know, Ms. Chang, regarding the ADU dwelling unit, L-A-S-H-A, T-E-F-R-A, now what fucking item am I on? You don't even know, but I'm talking about the agenda, because these fucking white nigger motherfuckers want to make people pay more than what they have to when current price was leasing, renting his own house to himself for $833. Now, how realistic is that shit? How fucking realistic is that shit? You people are being rent up the ass, 2,500, 3,500, well, that fucking dumb, bald boy over there, Marquise in Development Plum, allows this shakedown to put you white niggers like me out on the street. But, Stupid, as I said, on the Gunsberg Rent Adjustment Commission. What the fuck is that? People, you heard the man, he says he can't pay his fucking rent. He turned in his medical records like I did some seven, ten years ago when that fucking criminal Jose Weizar was trying to bend me over and fuck me. And he did. He made me homeless. He made me homeless. Jose Weizar, words with the rent control. Where's Lhasa? So tell me if I'm incorrect, stupid, about this alias and this number nine item and this fucking shit that goes on about the ADU financing pilot program. Because you know what? I could put several of those fucking units where I live right now. And believe me, I'll collect $833 in a heartbeat because fucking niggers can't live in a $2,500 luxury fucking apartment, boy. You know what I'm talking about, Negro. Get your ass out of your white collar suit and talk to me. Talk to me, I'll show you how to do the plan. Now for my non-agenda public comment, stupid. Now, because mommy up there shakes her shakers like this. You know, Please stay on topic, sir. Yeah, I'm talking about Ramen Noodle, who's running this committee on bullshit about how the fuck a white nigger like me, Tu Chan, or Chan, or whatever, ma'am, dealing with healthy and homelessness. I can relate. I was fucking homeless for two fucking years, sleeping in a garage, sleeping on the floor, renting a space in someone's fucking house, and I wasn't homeless. I like my own privacy. I like to scratch my nuts, walk up butt naked, and have a towel when I'm tired. But no, you want me to squat. <laughs> you want me to live like unrealistically like Mommy Noodle up there with her pushing her hair back, saying, oh, my two kids go to private school for $20, $25,000 a year. What do you fucking care? I make money. My husband's a studio man. Sir, no can you please stand? Cares. Please no stand topic, cares. sir. Yeah, girl. I got it. I got it. Now show it. Don't be stupid. Okay. Next speaker. Mickey 
Red Chief Hunt, Richard Corral, um, and I'll call the last two, Robert Lawrence um, and Tracy, you're here again. Did you want to speak again? Okay, <laughs> just confirming, okay. So, go ahead, sorry. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Mickey Goral. And what items are you speaking on today? I'm speaking on nine and 10. Okay, um, so you have two minutes. Okay, I am a resident of the Barrington Plaza. I've been there for 34 years. I had planned to stay there until I would retire from my job. I am a librarian at UCLA, and I'm also the uh, film liaison for the Pan-African Film Festival here in Los Angeles, a major cultural event. I think this whole eviction is disturbing, upsetting. Um, I don't think it's the proper use of the Ellis Act. I think that they can fix the apartments with us staying there or having or moving out for a short time under the Tenant Rehabilitation Act program. And um, it's just very concerning to me that this is allowed to go on. The uh, fact that the eviction notice for those people who had to move out came yesterday, or the deadline was yesterday, and this meeting with a report or a non-report is the day after, that's really disturbing because it really looks like it's discrimination against the tenants who are still living there. So um, I just hope that the planning office, the housing department, the city council, the city attorney, the mayor, everyone can do something to let us stay in our homes they are our homes. We do not want to be homeless. We do not want to be added to the homeless population in the city. And we have homes, so there's really no reason to throw over 500 units out on the street. Right. It's just unconscionable that this is happening in Los Angeles. And I would hope that you will be able to do something positive to support the tenants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, we have uh, just a couple of remaining speakers, Red Chief Hunt, Richard Corral, or Corral, and Robert Lawrence. Those are our last speakers. Right. You never saw corn and quam. Okay. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Corral. I'm CEO and Principal Consultant of Corral Consulting, and I'm the co-chair of the Affordable Housing and Homelessness Solutions Work Group comprised of 100% affordable housing investors, developers, small property owners, modular factory operators, and nonprofit homeless service Sir? providers. Sir, our, I'm going to interrupt you for just one second. What items are you speaking on? Item six in general comment. No worries. Okay, so you have two minutes. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, our work group has developed and shared our recommendations to advance the production of affordable housing with the Affordable Housing Commission and the mayor's housing team, which includes ADUs as a solution to address homelessness. Our work, our work group shares its support for Council Member Bob Blumenfeld's motion that requests reports from LAHD and CAO to create a pilot program to house formerly homeless Angelinos in ADUs. I'm especially excited as today's committee conversation on ADUs is over two years in the making. Our work group supports the LAHD and CAO's recommendations to subsidize construction loans as well as issuing an RFP to engage nonprofit partners to manage an ADU pilot program. Our work group also supports using ULA funds to subsidize ADU construction to house low acuity individuals and families that are at risk of homelessness, have recently experienced homelessness, or are ready to transition from temporary housing, especially those with time limited subsidies and Section 8 vouchers. Thank you for your leadership, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you for that comment and for your work. Next speaker, we have just Robert Lawrence, I believe. Hi. I'm going to speak on items 9 and 10. Okay, so you have two minutes. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, I'm a resident of Barrington Plaza. And, and you are, Robert? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I'm, a, I'm also a resident of uh, Barrington Plaza, who is, ha has an extension till May of 2024, but I'm here on behalf of my fellow tenants who are being evicted for, from their homes as we speak. And many of them have been here for years. Their legitimate extensions were rejected by Douglas Summit, our multi-million dollar corporate landlord. One person I'd like to speak about specifically to make this very personal story is known as Auntie Linda, the fairy dog, dog uh, godmother of Barrington Plaza Dog Park. Um, 
She has been at Barrington Plaza for four decades, okay? She lived to see the dogs play in the park. And at the end of April, well, I got a notice, as did many of our residents, did, that the dog park is now closed for unleashed dogs. It was devastating to her. When I went to this community manager at Douglas Summit and I said, why are you doing this? He said, there's no reason, we're just doing it. And I said, I don't understand. He said, Robert, if you don't like it here, you can move. A week later, we got our eviction notices. So I guess she was very, very literal when she said that to me. Uh, now Auntie Linda has no dog park to go to. She's a recovering alcoholic, and now she's going to the bar when she would have gone to the dog park. It's just a tragic story. That was totally unnecessary. It didn't have to happen. Um, but this is just one of many incidents of reduction of essential services, harassment, intimidation, and other aggressive tactics which Douglas Summit has employed to drive us tenants out of our homes. Um, it would not only be a list of my own experiences, which has become a territory since I wrote an op-ed piece in the LA Times published in July, but uh, for many other tenants, which include stalking of a female tenant by a head security guard, constant shutdown of elevators, unlawfully attempting to evict tenants for unpaid COVID rent, closure of the fitness center, the sabotage of the laundry room, and the new edict of refusing to notify tenants of delivery of their packages, so they're, they're gone missing. Uh, the blacking out of, uh, is that one minute? That's, that was two minutes. Oh, Those sorry. Were your two items. Do I have one more last comment? For general public comment? Yeah. Okay, yes, you have one uh, more minute. Uh, um, okay, so anyway, D D Douglas Emmett is un unlawfully using the Ellis Act to evict the remaining tenants with the head of, with, uh, because when actually the head of Fire Sprinklers Union told me they could easily accomplish all of the work they need to do without evicting one tenant. Uh, please help us keep the last affordable housing on the west side. If Douglas Summit is able to get away with this, it will set a precedent for the entire state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and I believe that's all our speakers. Okay. Um, I'm going to recommend that we take items uh, 1 through 2, 4 through 5, 7 through 8, and 10 through 12 on consent as amended, unless there's any objections. Yep, 1, one and 2, 4 and 5, 7 and 8, and 10, 11, 12. So that leaves for consideration 3, 6, 9, 13, and potentially 14 and 15 together. Uh, I have a, a very minor amendment I'd like to, I can just read on, on seven, that you can take it up now in that group, but if, with, as amended. Sure, go ahead. It, would, it simply strikes, with the assistance of the CAO to read, um, basically, and the CAO. So then it says, seven. I therefore move the council, instruct the, let's CLA, and then it says, with the assistance of the CAO and to change that to just strike with the assistance so it reads instruct the chief legislative analyst and, and the, the, CLA. C, the city okay. administrative officer okay so CLA that. and CAO together for item seven CLO both of them together what if I were to object to that <laughs> no just What's that? <laughs> what if I were like no absolutely not no just kidding that's totally fine okay. um, any other notes okay um, can you call the roll Ms. Morales Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Absent. Four ayes. These items are approved as stated for the record. Okay. Great. Uh, let's start with item three. Since I think this will be quick, this is the roadmap. Ms. Morales, can you please read this item into the record? Item number three is a city administrative officer report relative to the 19th report regarding COVID-19 homelessness roadmap funding recommendations. Great. Um, and I did not require a presentation. I pulled this off uh, consent only because I heard that Mr. Blumenfield had some questions. Some amendments. And amendments. Okay. Um, did you want a presentation? I have, yeah, I have questions. You have questions? Okay. So I think... We don't need a presentation. I think we can just get started with questions, if that's all right. We also have um, Lhasa here, if, you get, if there's some questions pertaining to them, if you want them to come up now. Okay. If, some, if a representative from Lhasa wanted to join at the table, that might be useful. Okay, let's start with Mr. Blumenfield. 
Well, I could, I've got questions and amendments. So you want me to just see the amendments first? Or is that? Um, I think we could do questions first. Okay. And then, yeah. And then Actually, you. It depends what are your amendments. Yeah, it depends on what your amendments are. That's right. Why don't I read the amendments? Okay, go and ahead. Then, and then at least they're, they're not. One is to instruct LAHD to notify CAO and CLA when LASA submits a budget modification request. Can, sorry, um, I'm having a little trouble hearing him. Sorry about that. If you could repeat that, that would be great. Okay. There's five instructions. One is to instruct LAHD to notify CAO and CLA when LASA submits a budget modification request. Okay. Second is to instruct LAHD with the assistance of CAO, CLA, and LASA to review LASA's contract and develop improvements that enable better tracking of program expenditures, savings, performance metrics, and transparency with quarterly reports to council. Okay. Third is to request LASA to report back on how funding for time-limited subsidies for fiscal year 23-24 will be distributed across the city and establish an allocation process that seeks input from council and mayor with a minimum of 20 time, TLS, time-limited subsidies, set aside for each council district. Uh, the fourth is to instruct LAHD with the assistance of CLA and CAO to draft contract amendment language that aligns with CF 23-0844 and CF 23-0882 to establish, quote, good neighbor policies and community agreements with service providers operating interim and or permanent supportive housing. Since we're opening up the contract, want to put that in there. And then fifth is to instruct LAHD with the assistance of the CLA and CAO to draft contract amendment language that sets performance metrics for LASA and subcontracted service providers. So those are the, the... I'm happy to second those amendments. Five amendments, okay. Okay, do you want to kick us off with a question or two and then we can go from there? Um, I'll, I'll defer to Ms. Rodriguez at the moment while I'm looking at my papers here and I'll come back to you. Okay, Ms. Rodriguez, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, and thank you, Mr. Bloomingfield, for your amendments uh, on this. I think they're all very important. Part of what my, what my, I continue to struggle with is how resources appear to be utilized interchangeably uh, without further uh, transparency in terms of what the outcomes are associated with the funds. And so, uh, among the uh, CARE Act funding, uh, one million dollars for expenses related to Tropical Storm Hillary. Can you uh, provide some further insight as to again, just the context in which you know how these how these funds are used? And again, this this goes back to the fact that uh, there's a lot of emergency authority that's been given, and as a result of that, there's been a thumbing of the nose to this council for the accountability associated with the resources that are being expended with a number of these efforts. So I want to understand how these, uh, how these dollars were, were utilized and, and uh, in terms of what we're advancing in terms of these resources and what we uh, anticipate recovering as a result of some of the emergency orders uh, associated with some of these events, like, for example, the, the, the storm. Uh, good afternoon, Mindy Patongsonen with the Office you, of the CAO. Can uh, you pull it a little closer? Right. Thanks. All right, Mindy Patongsonen with the Office of the CAO. Uh, so just to give a brief overview of the, the funding of ESGCV, there is an expenditure deadline of September 30th of 2023 to expend these funds. And so um, when it came to Tropical Storm Hillary, we have not really programmed set aside funds for inclement weather. We only have the general fund that we allocated about 1.5 million to LASA. And that's mainly going to be dedicated to the winter shelter program during October, or sorry, November through March. And so, um, LASA had incurred costs in relation to Tropical Storm Hillary in the amount of about $978,000, which includes um, wrap pop up sites, motel vouchers, meals, um, outreach to get, bring people inside. And so, um, we want. So, do we anticipate that those expenditures, for example, would be eligible for reimbursement given the emergency order? For the emergency solutions grant? Correct. Um, or so, no, because when it when we have a declaration of emergency, for mm -hmm. example, uh, with respect to the storm, mm -hmm. those anything that we expend, the receipts of anything we expend, are then eligible for uh, reimbursement, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's with the state or 
depending on the level of uh, designation of emergency. And as I recall, it was state declared, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in addition to whatever the city did, there was state declaration. And so my question is, are we applying for reimbursement with that? And, uh, and again, this is, I, I just want to be clear because what we're doing is we've already funded LASA to do work, okay? Uh, we've already, LASA has been more than fully funded in every measure that we want to, in, including Insight Safe. But when we talk about how we're applying these dollars, I want to better understand, is this an approach and a methodology that we're using this money in order to fund, for example, through, are we, are we going to recover these funds? Uh, what part of this work isn't already covered and funded under the work that LASA should just be doing and providing on an ongoing basis, given that we've already fully funded them for everything else? Why are we? providing additional resources uh, as if the services are not already available to be provided. Right, regarding the cost for the um, for reimbursements, I think our office is already in the process of or is in the process of being caused, so we'll ha have to report back on whether these costs are eligible. I think it'll be dependent on the funding source as well um, mm -hmm. regarding the reimbursements and um, with it, regarding uh, with LASA being funded fully already, especially for like winter shelter, again, like if we had them front, if we utilized the existing resources already, it would have taken away for the winter shelter operations during the fiscal year. And so we would have had to make them whole to be, um, to be able to cover the costs for this fiscal year, um, from the cost from the storm. Could I ask just a little supplementary question here? I, I believe from my understanding in, in the district, um, uh, lots of teams worked over the weekend, which they are not traditionally funded for, not traditional contracts weren't funded for. So maybe you could provide a clarification of if those were added costs or whether they were able to be covered by normal sources of LASA funding. Good afternoon. Uh, Nathaniel Fagao, Acting Chief Program mm -hmm. Officer for LASA. Um, so for in our response to the, storm, the Tropical Storm Hillary, um, as uh, Mindy pointed out, um, we do have uh, funding for our winter shelter, which is uh, slated uh, October 30th or November 1st, rather, through uh, March 30th. Um, that is funded at approximately $1.5 million. Um, we, if we utilize that funding to, to pay for uh, what was expended in response to Tropical Storm Hillary, that would leave us very little to be able to actually operate uh, the shelters uh, through the winter season. Uh, hence the request for uh, funds specifically for this response. Uh, in, uh, to uh, Councilmember Rahman's uh, point, uh, we stood up uh, eight shelters within the city, uh, bringing on board uh, providers uh, that um, were not already contracted for winter shelter uh, to be able to operate those sites, provided um, uh, meals. Also, as Councilmember Rahman pointed out, our we had a significant number of staff that would not normally be scheduled to work the weekend who were working 12 and 15 hour days um, through throughout the storm. Um, so there are definite overtime costs associated there. Um, and then we also uh, did have motel voucher costs uh, working with the mayor's office. Uh, we extended the capacity of 211 to be able to serve additional families to ensure that there were no families that would be unsheltered uh, during the, the storm. Um, Additionally, as we uh, were demobilizing the sites, there was a specific effort to ensure that we weren't demobilizing folks uh, from this emergency response just back to the street. Um, so we had a concerted effort in placing folks into shelter. Uh, there were all, all but eight individuals that we sheltered during the response were able to be placed uh, in shelter or uh, walked away from the shelters before we could place them. Um, we motel vouchered uh, those eight and uh, have an additional families that came in specifically in response to the storm that we're working to uh, place into permanent housing from there. So that so is the... So we're talking about eight, really, because you said, I'm sorry, just, just to repeat, how many, because, and, and help, help educate me in differentiating the difference between when we, you know, we've, we've gone through uh, significant emergency events in this city multiple times. Uh, and so while I can appreciate the, you know, and I had the emergency winter shelter for the entire San Fernando Valley in my district, so I'm not 
ignorant to its operations. My question is, is that we also have recreation and parks that are utilizing their facilities and we're also standing up those uh, evacuation centers for everybody. So help me understand and differentiate who is accommodated through what is being funded through this effort, uh, what the matriculation is to perhaps a more permanent solution and how that differs from whatever might be aided or provided support that would be offered at, you know, could, could we not just utilize, I, my big thing is I hate paying for the same thing twice. Understood. I really, it irritates me. Same here. So, uh, well, uh, Lhasa. So my question is, is what coordination have you ever engaged in during an emergency event to address the same population at some of our recreation and parks uh, emergency s shelter sites? So the rec and park shelter sites were the ones that I was referencing that we stood up in collaboration with, with rec and parks. So we used rec and park facilities. So okay, so they were the rec and parks facilities. Correct. So my question is then what, so with any other emergency storm, how does this differ from what the engagement or the practice has been in the past? The most significant difference is the, the time of year that, um, that it came about. When we've had other storm responses, it's been during the winter shelter season, and we already have the apparatus in place for the augmented winter shelters, which is funded out of the, the winter shelter budget. So as part of our winter shelter response, we stand up the sites, including the one in your district, uh, that are uh, up and operational throughout that season. Additionally, we have uh, what we refer to as our augmented winter shelter response, that allows us to stand up additional capacity uh, in uh, severe weather events during that st that season. So, where there so are. So, did you exceed the existing capacity for what like for the facilities that we already have? Those facilities are not operational outside of the winter shelter season. So, when you're utilizing our recreation and parks facilities, what was the uh, what was the utilization? What was your capacity? Did you still re did you still retain? Uh, space in, in those facilities? Were, the, were they exhausted? Were the facilities exhausted in terms of the demand? No, not, not 100%. No, we saw uh, several facilities at 100%. There are several facilities that were opened uh, because we saw the utilization uh, and there was movement, including from uh, Councilmember Blumenfield to open additional sites that opened on Sunday. Those we did not see significant utilization in large measure because of the timing uh, that they were opened. So there wasn't the advanced push uh, and outreach that allowed us to bring so many folks in on Saturday. Okay. Um, in terms of the accommodations that were made for individuals, how many of them were actually uh, native to the areas uh, of the immediate environment, in the immediate surroundings of where these locations were stood up? They were all placed with uh, the closest proximate site. Um, so, and, I, and the reason why I'm asking the question is because I know among the facilities, for example, in my district was Lakeview Terrace Rec Center. Mm -hmm. It's always our facility. I also know that the city of Burbank has always um, uh, apparently made themselves welcome to the emergency winter shelter site in my district. So my question is, were accommodations provided or of the families or individuals that were supported, were they from outside of the city limits originally? To my knowledge, no. The, the focus of our outreach was specific to, uh, primarily to the wash areas and the riverbeds within the city of LA, so within your district, uh, Hanson Dam and the Oro Vista Wash above, uh, as well as the, the flow down into the LA River from there, uh, including the tributaries. We had a significant focus in the um, uh, Sepulveda Basin uh, and the wash areas surrounding there, uh, and the entirety of the LA River, including the, um, the confluence um, at the base of Dodger Stadium there. Uh, so the, the primary focus for our outreach were folks who were in the most immediate danger of uh, storm water surge and, uh, uh, and flooding as a result of the storm uh, to ensure that there would be no loss of life. So can you run through your numbers again for me? You said uh, how many, how, what was the, what were the total numbers served and uh, how many of those individuals then were matriculated into a more permanent solution? Um, or a more interim permanent solution. Want yeah, we had, uh, I can get you the exact numbers in just a moment. I uh, didn't bring that sheet up with me. We had approximately 300 folks that were served in the Rec and Park facilities. Um, of those, as I said, uh, we placed uh, all but eight 
uh, that remained at the time that those shelters were closed um, into other interim housing. Uh, so they're placed into existing interim housing beds. Um, there were eight that remained that we did not have uh, interim housing spaces for uh, that we did place into motels uh, that we are um, working with them on permanent housing solutions from there and also trying to get them into interim housing. So they're, uh, of the eight that were placed, uh, one has already been placed into a shelter. We're working on the other seven. Uh, as well as working directly to, um, to you permanent You said housing. permanent shelter, so it's interim or is it permanent? No, it, the, the motels are, uh, we're trying to make them as short term as possible, so trying to get them into interim housing from the motel so that we're not continuing to pay motel vouchers. Uh, while uh, we're waiting for the, the ability to place them into interim housing, we're also working on placements into permanent housing. So if we can skip interim housing and get them directly into permanent housing, we would do that. Thank you. Um, could we move on to Councilmember Bloomfield? Sure. Uh, I appreciate the questions asked by my colleague. Kind of building on, on some of that, there's, it was 935,000 was the item, was the total amount, right? Is there an itemized breakdown of that? Like how much for staffing, how much for meals, how much for services, how much for motel vouchers? I have the, one document that breaks some of it. Yes, we have the breakdown. We actually provided that information to your, your team, but I can walk through that with you if you'd like. Okay, I have, I have some, I mean, how, so, okay, so let's, let's talk about that. How, how many staff were, were actually needed to manage the eight emergency sites? The staff managing the sites were actually contracted agencies. Uh, I don't have the exact number of staff for each of those agencies. Is that, is that counting? Because I'm assuming that the numbers we have here, they don't include the Rec and Parks, the city numbers, right? Because we paid nope. also for city employees to be staffing and everything else. That is not included in this, correct. Okay. Um, so that, that you don't have an exact number of how many, or you're saying because it was contracted out? Yeah, we, we utilized our uh, uh, contracted providers to, to operate the sites. Okay. And Would it be possible just to get that information maybe? Yes, we could Thank get you. that back. I just don't have it. Oh, that would be great. And then, and then the type, what types of services did they have at the emergency sites? Uh, primarily, the, the services were primarily focused on ensuring uh, folk safety at the sites. So it, uh, um, it was meals, meals provided, uh, uh, escorting folks to shower. Some of the facilities had showers uh, in the facility. Others, there were uh, pool facilities proximate to the sites. Um, some that even there was a, a you know a short transport needed uh, to be able to access those so assuring that folks uh, could access the, the facilities as needed um, and uh, they helped us in uh, the assessment of individuals and being able to place them into uh, shelter uh, as the sites were closing so the 135 people in the emergency shelters were enrolled 135 of them as i understand were enrolled by uh, het members into the existing interim housing program 72 accepted the referrals um, but their additional costs with um, with its existing LASA HET members doing the work, so we're paying, the, is, that, is that how it works? The existing members get, we have the LASA HET workers, is this overtime for the weekends? Is that what that is? Yeah, it would be overtime, correct. Okay. And then why is there a need for the city to provide an additional 93000 for admin costs when we're already providing the $4.9 million this fiscal year and the additional million from, from last year? Admin costs are just included as a percentage to ensure that we have the resources available. The ESGCV money that we have, we receive, and we do have a 10% um, that's already allocated for that. And the additional would just be uh, the 5% that we would say would be charged to HAP. I think one of the things that I just wanted to highlight is we're not asking for additional funds. We're asking for the ability to repurpose funds that we discover would be underspent. So this is moving money from the ES uh, initial um, allocations for ESGCB and then asking it to be used for this specific purpose. So you mean it's taking it out of the 1.5 million? So as a part of the ESGCB allocation, we would be asking for this to be, for us to have the ability to use this, those resources to cover these costs. So we're saying that to support the effort, it was a $975,000 cost in addition to the cost that we already have. So it's um, to stand up the sites, um, because this is outside of our normal winter shelter time period, to have our teams being there to support. And there was some admin um, operational staff who were there supporting this effort 
working throughout the weekend, driving trucks to make sure things got to the various sites. So there are costs associated with supporting the effort that we want to be able to cover using okay. the resources that have been identified. I think the question, if I may just um, press on it, I think Councilmember Blumenfield was asking if this, came, which source of money this was reprogrammed from, and I don't think we understood that because it's not so it's, coming it's, from the emergency, the winter shelter program. No. It's coming from somewhere else. Maybe you could just clarify. So where the it's ESGCV from. within the roadmap, there's line items that have been identified as having underspend. So we're asking to repurpose those funds to cover these costs. And those already included an administrative exactly. fee in that original exactly. program expenditure. And what were those originally programmed to? Uh, there's, it's a, it's a <laughs> list of various um, line items. So okay. um, there's about um, recommendation 22 of the report for free program $6.6 .6 million of ESGCB underspend coming from um, savings from sites that were, um, had delayed op openings or construction. Had to what? Sorry. Had delay openings like during um, the course of like the Got it. last three years of the Got roadmap, it. okay, and also um, delayed construction. So that they're not going to spend the funds in time. So we took funds from there and reprogrammed. And so nine hundred seventy thousand of, of the six point six million is going towards um, the inclement weather program. Okay. Yeah, I mean it. It feels uh, process-wise a little ad hoc, you know, in that that we have an emergency and then. Um, or every time we have an emergency, lots of them will come to us for more money, um, which isn't a good way to, to budget. Um, we should have a strategy and a plan, and we should be following it so we have un, un, a clear understanding of how much we're spending and where that money is going and what it's going for. Uh, it feels a little backwards um, the, way it, the way it went down, and, I mean, it is what it is at the moment. But... Um, Ideally, we'd, we'd get money up front, we'd have the discussions, develop a game plan. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna highlight, we, we did in our 23-24 um, budget, we requested money to be able to support specific activities such as this. Um, and so that was not um, a part of what was budgeted, it was awarded um, through that budgeting process. And so what we're also doing is just coming back and saying, Given what we, we're seeing um, with what's going on in our environment, the global warming, we are seeing that there's probably going to be this type of events that are coming up. And we, when we were asked to stand up programs in, in the past, that did eat into that winter shelter bucket. And so we, we're just trying to do our due diligence to ensure that we have the resources that we need to do just what you're saying, plan ahead, and have the resources identified. So this is almost like a two-part ask. It's an ask to replenish the funds or have the funds to allocate to the resource, the cost that we incurred to stand up this um, emergency response, and then to also create a line item within our existing general fund budget that will then allow you to add funding as other emergencies come up um, so that we can have that planning process um, already thought about and incorporated into the, the budget. Right, and of course we can do it not just in the one big budget. We, we deal with budgeting issues throughout the year, so it doesn't all need to be up front. It's also why I, mean, I had a motion uh, a while back asking for, for a loss of a report on some of this and we still haven't fully gotten all that information yet. So anyway, I appreciate it and appreciate the extra uh, information here on, on some of the numbers. I'm still, still trying to, pro I got these numbers today. I'm still trying to, to well, process what, what. At least you what, have the numbers, Mr. Blumenfield. I have some numbers, yes. Great. Uh, but thank you. Great. Did you still have an additional yeah. comment? I mean, I, I just to, to piggyback, it doesn't feel ad hoc. It feels exploitive. And uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm concerned about is when we talk about, you know, we're, we're talking about a storm event. So it became a non-storm event, but, you know, in, in terms of, of uh, the number of days um, and the administrative fee associated with, with standing up Folks that are already there, they're already, they're already contracted uh, service providers. So I'm trying to ascertain all of the, what feels like exorbitant costs or, or like, I, I have no other word other than to say exploitive, not ad hoc, because it just feels like it's a seizing of an opportunity rather than uh, hard numbers in terms of associated costs. And 
uh, it, you know, particularly when I know, uh, having stood up a lot of emergency shelters in my district, um, you know, I know what Rec and Parks does. And I'm trying to ascertain what the difference is, is I, I understand the outreach component um, and whatever those hard costs are associated with that outreach. But in terms of the food, in terms of some of the things that you talked about, that's what Rec and Parks provides in these shelters. So that's what I'm trying to understand. What, what, when we have these emergency events, when we have these storm-related events, a lot of that is already offered by Rec and Parks. So distilling more specifically what we're talking about for me is important because that's when I say I have concerns about what it feels like double dipping, where it, it, I want to make sure that we're not paying for the same thing twice. I know we've gotten accustomed to doing that here, uh, but I'd like us to, at some point, deviate from that practice. So uh, I think, Mr. Blumenfield, I appreciate that you've got some numbers. I would love to see them. I think that would, uh, I would say, LASA, uh, NCAO, uh, that should be a regular practice that you guys just are forthcoming with providing some of that, some of the actual numbers, not the account transfers and everything else. That's all great. Uh, that's all the technical stuff. What we have an obligation to do is, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility here, and I think having uh, transparency with what was expended in the manner that it was expended very deliberately is an important part of the conversation for us to have. And uh, because we will be having, I'm sure, the subsequent conversations when we're in budget deliberations and whatnot, uh, but it feels like an end run to that process. So. Um, that I just, you know. So, uh, if, if I may, I, um, is, is my microphone okay? Um, uh, it's my understanding that uh, the same information that was shared with Councilmember Bloomingfield staff was also shared with your staff. I will follow up and make sure that it has been shared um, because I agree that, that you all should have uh, the, the full information. In terms of. Well, the public should have all the information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in, in terms of the Rec and Park sites, uh, the Rec and Park uh, staff do not are not able to provide food, uh, and the providers that we uh, brought on to operate the sites um, were not prior contracted for, for these resources. This was uh, an emergency response. Each of those agencies stepped up uh, to um, bring staff on board, uh, many of whom, most of whom, if not all of whom, were um, were staff employed elsewhere and, and were needing to be able to um, be paid overtime hours because they uh, were leveraged from other programming. Um, so this is additional costs on top of uh, other contracts that, that those agencies may have. Um, the Rec and Parks team were tremendous partners to us and, and I cannot thank the Rec and Parks department enough. Uh, without them this, uh, this effort would not have been possible. Um, but the services that, that we uh, contracted for with our providers and provided ourselves were not duplicative to what, what they were able to provide. The, they did have staff on site to support, um, but they've also been very clear with us um, throughout all of the emergency responses that they do not feel uh, that they're appropriately equipped to manage shelters fully themselves uh, and have specifically requested um, providers to be on site uh, to be able to help address the needs of, of unsheltered individuals coming in in these emergency circumstances. Okay. Thank well, then that's, uh, I think, a subsequent conversation that we'll have with EMD and, uh, and Recreation and Parks because this isn't going to be our first, this certainly hasn't been our first emergency, nor will it be our last. Um, but to, uh, we have to project what anticipated expenses are going to be for operationalizing a lot of these facilities. To hear, I'm familiar with how quickly EMD and Rec and Parks has stood up a number of emergency facilities. We just had it in response to a, a private property circumstance in my district. Uh, but a lot of the same services and, and, uh, and accommodations were provided. So I just want to be clear about what pot of money it's coming out of, how we're expending these resources, to what extent, you know, again, I still have heartburn around, you know, we always have the conversation around the administrative, and I've been a huge advocate, but this isn't chump change. And so when it, it, it compiles and it continues to be concerning 
that, you know, I want to be very clear up front and in advance what the expenses are associated with, uh, to what degree we provided services, because we're talking about a few days, and what the matriculation was of these individuals so that we can actually measure the dollars and cents of what these, uh, what, what we're standing up, and uh, who, who's, whose nut are we covering in this? Because I know Rec and Parks and some of our other city departments are equally taxed uh, on providing the services in these circumstances. Thank you. Mr. Harris Dawson, and then I'm gonna request that we close this item. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, I just wanna be, I, I'll be short uh, because I think we had a very thorough discussion I, and I appreciate the preparation of Mr. Blumenfeld and Ms. Uh, Rodriguez. I just wanna ask plainly, do you all feel like we are paying for things twice? And if so, who's getting, the, getting paid twice for the same services? Um, and then my follow-up question is, do, it just seems like this should be simple and it seems like it's complicated. Every time we come to the table, it seems complicated to you all. So I just wanna ask the question in, the, in as plain a way as possible. Uh, do, you th do you feel like in fact there's double dipping? In plain and simple, no. Uh, uh, as, I, as we stated at the beginning of this conversation, <clears throat> there is funding on the table for uh, weather related events. That is the winter shelter uh, pot of money. Um, if we are going to be able to stand up winter shelter response uh, as we do uh, year after year, uh, if we utilize that money to pay for the response for Hillary, we will not be able to have that winter shelter response uh, the, for this coming upcoming season. Uh, hence the request for the, um, the, you know, the transition of, of the uh, ESG CV to, to cover this. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the, the, Ms. Rodriguez ra raised the parks and this actually is a policy question that I have for you all or what your experience is. Within my district, I had different parks doing different things, right? So one park would say, oh yeah, we're gonna give people food as they come in. Another park would say, well, we don't have budget for that. Now, my understanding is all of them have money for food. Uh, and, and in that moment, of course, you gotta deal with the people that are in front of you. And so the organizations respond uh, but but how do you all figure that out when there's a when you have the expectation that someone else is going to pay for something because that's partly what what we're putting forward here at this committee when you all are you all expect someone else to pay for something you get there and you find out that they're, they're not going to do that or at least that's not their understanding so for for this response we coordinated the uh, the purchase and delivery of food for all sites so there was no there was no expectation that Rec and Parks was going to provide food. No, got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I just just want to say I appreciate all the questions, the detailed questions about the budgeting. Um, I think it's it is really important to make sure that we are aware of how much emergency services are going to cost and try and plan for that in advance as much as possible. Particularly given the fact that it's not just going to be storms, it's also going to be heat. Um, it's going to be wildfire. It's going to be a lot of things that, that are going to impact us. Um, in addition to all of the discussion, I did just also want to say that although Hurricane, Hurricane ended up being less um, intense than we expected in LA City, um, I did see that the city and LASA really mobilized around preparations for it in a, in a very a cohesive way um, and that we had for example in our stretch of the river we had lots of outreach workers um, going up and down the river picking people up and bringing them to shelter sites and and things that we had to request in the past specifically um, which we didn't have to request this time around because Lhasa had already planned for it so I appreciated that was a change that I do just want to note um, that our ability to respond to these situations, which was not as present in a previous set of rains that our district um, dealt with and had to deal with people along the river, this time was dealt with. So in addition to, I think, all the room for improvement that I think we all have as a system, I think it is also important to note and acknowledge the fact that there have already been some improvements made, and I'm grateful for that. So thank you for that, um, and thank you for also for all the incredible questions. I think this was a really great discussion, and I think leaves us a good opportunity to do better planning as we move forward. So with that, I'm gonna uh, move that we close discussion on this item. And thank you all for coming to the table.
And I don't believe we have to take an action on this item. Is that right? Well, I had some amendments that I think we have to take action on. Oh, right. right. But at this, uh, or is there a vote to be taken? Well, we're instructing LAHD to do a number okay. of things. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to vote on additional amendments that we're going to move forward. On the, on the okay. instructions. The That's what you were trying to tell me. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's vote on the um, additional instructions that Mr. Blumenfield has provided on this item. So can you please call the roll? Thank you. Council Member Rahman? Thank yes. Council Member Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Harris Dawson? Yes. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Five ayes. This item is approved as amended. Thank you very much. Let's move on to item nine, which is the update from the housing department and from the city attorney uh, on Barrington Plaza. You wanna read that item into the record for us? Thank you. Item number nine is a verbal update from the Los Angeles Housing Department relative to motion Park Recorian regarding the status of the Alice Act process and relocation of tenants at the Barrington Plaza apartments located at 11740 Wilshire Boulevard in Council District 11. Okay, and uh, if you all want to introduce yourselves at the table, I think that would be helpful for everyone. Uh, good morning, Council. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. Robert Gallardi, Director of Code Enforcement, Housing Department. Thank you. Good afternoon, Anna Ortega, Assistant General Manager of the Housing Department. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Emma Garcia. I'm a <coughs> Senior Management Analyst, too, with the Housing Department. Good afternoon, Elaine Zong from the City Attorney's Office. And good afternoon, Peter Walford, also from the City Attorney's Office. Great. Thank you all. Um, and did you want to start off with your report? And I will say that I, I do want to lift up um, Councilmember Park's request at the beginning of the discussion, which was that I think for an event, uh, for a, an issue that is impacting so many families I you know I think it would be useful to have a written record of your report um, in the council file and so if I could make a request that we do that uh, in you know going forward I think that would be very helpful for us Certainly. and for any future discussion items on this I think it would be useful to have a written report in addition to a verbal report certainly um, just by way of background the Barrington Plaza is at 11 740 Wilshire Boulevard as you know in Council District 11 it's a large um, uh, multi-family residential property with 712 units, over three towers, A, B, and C. Of those 712 units, 684 are RSO, and 28 of them have luxury exemptions from the RSO. And um, this, this today is about the filing of uh, an app of um, Alice withdrawal um, of, the, of the units, of all of the units from the rental housing market that was filed by the ownership on May 8th. Um, they filed a notice of intent to withdraw and they at that time stated that they were undecided about the future use of the property. We've been asked to report back on um, the process and the protections to the tenants. So the protections to the tenants are three main things relocation assistance. Some tenants have um, the right to claim an extended tenancy. Most tenants get 120 day notice, but disabled and elderly tenants may request an extension for up to a year. And then the third uh, tenant protection is the right to return. So this is a big project uh, with a lot of units and it's been very fluid with a lot of a lot of claims and questions to deal with. It was complicated by the fact that the ownership, um, although the city has a relocation services provider, the ownership elected to also provide their own independent relocation services provider with what they called enhanced services. So um, that was fine if they're going to provide additional services, but we did keep the city's relocation service provider to ensure that everything that's required under the RSO is carried out. Um, there's definite timelines with an Ellis that was filed, as I mentioned, on May 8th, and tenants have 120 days to relocate unless they're uh, approved for an extension. 
Um, so sadly, yesterday was the 120th day. Uh, so some of the tenants are now, would have needed to, to relocate. With regard to relocation, that's one of the big tasks that our relocation services provider does. 577 units, all of them, um, had relocation determinations completed. 155 of the 577 were qualified for the highest relocation amount of $22,950. There have also been, during these past few months, 60 appeals about the um, relocation determination. Some of the majority of the relocation appeals are from the tenants, but there were also, oh no, the majority were filed by the landlord, 36 of them. Um, the others, to a total of 60, were filed by the tenants. Almost all of them have been decided, decided but as I mentioned, I think we even got one appeal today. So the process has been continuing all of these weeks. A very big protection that's um, important to the tenants is the right to claim an extended tenancy. This is available, as I mentioned, for tenants who are disabled or 62 years of age and over. In the Ellis process, the request for an extended tenancy is made by the tenant to the landlord. Usually the city and we, the department, don't get involved with that. Um, but in this case, there started to be questions and confusion and requests for assistance from the tenant. So we volunteered at LAHD to have our uh, relocation services provider provide another level of review. And this mainly was about um, the, the claims of disability where some of the tenants and who we met with and who have contacted us informed us that they were uncomfortable sharing their medical records with the Barrington management. Um, usually under our normal procedures, we don't require proof of the medical conditions, but we volunteered to, to provide another level of review where tenants could let us know uh, about their medical condition, and then we would uh, intervene with Barrington to inform them that the city had documentation that certain tenants qualified for that extension. As of today, 156 households have been confirmed by the landlord to have a one-year extension, which means they have until May 8, 2024, to, um, to vacate. Nine of these were through LAHD's intervention. There are 48 units that have claimed an extended tenancy that are being disputed by the landlord or have already been confirmed not to be eligible. There is two things that they have to have in order to be eligible. They had to have filed with the owner by July 7th. Not all tenants met that deadline. And they have to be, again, disabled or 62 years of age or more. Um, of the 48 that are being disputed, Six of them were filed after the deadline. Um, today, we have 19 that uh, LHD staff has met with the um, Barrington's attorney and told them that we believe they're entitled to an extension of the, um, of the tenancy. Nine have been approved by Barrington. 10 are still pending, but we're hopeful that um, those will be approved. With regard to the right to return, this applies to if the same rental units that exist today are put back on the rental market within 10 years, the tenants may inform the property owner that they're interested in coming back and they need to do this within 30 days of their vacating the unit. So there's still another 30 days for the first group and there'll be another 30 days after May of 2024. So far, 156 units have filed a uh, notice of a request to return to the units. There's a few issues. Um, I will say that Barrington ownership may have followed the letter of the law technically, uh, and they appear to be offering additional benefits by having their own relocation consultant but given the level of disruption to the lives of 577 households, 
I would say that Barrington has not proceeded with empathy and has refused to make minimum concessions to ease the transition. For example, a big mm -hmm. one is LHD recommended to Barrington that since they were granting extended tenancies to a number of tenants, 155 as of now, they, we recommended that they extend all of the tenants that requested such, a, such, a, such an extension. They can't start the work with 155 occupied households. They declined. Um, they are also um, following the procedures for the payment of relocation, uh, which um, they've put in an escrow account, and that's fine. But we have complaints from tenants that Barrington is refusing to pay them their full relocation unless they give them um, a tax W-9 form. If the tenant doesn't want to give them the information, then, then they're withholding, I believe it's 24%. And they have advised us that this is under their um, attorney's advice for tax law. The, we, sorry, could you clarify again that the tenant is being asked to provide their tax A W-9 form that gives their social security number and I believe that's used to report earnings. Is that required under it is the under our not under process? our procedures, no, but they Barrington is um, relying on their counsel's advice that they because they're a corporation they need this information. Um, as that is something that LHD may pursue uh, as a as a violation of the RSO for failure to pay the full relocation amount. But right now we're still discussing it. Um, there were also rent reductions for the closure of the gym for several months. This, we got 78 complaints for that. What we needed in order to um, pursue a reduction in services was the tenant's lease. We have I believe it's eight out of the 78 tenants have provided their lease, indicating that they uh, started their tenancy prior to the closure of the gym in January of 2020. And again, the status of 19 households is pending um, a decision on their extended stay. I think the biggest thing is that we would have we strongly advise that they go ahead and extend tenancies for any tenant that requested it, and they have not done uh, agreed to do that. Um, so that's that's a summary of where we are today with the LS process. We're still pushing for some of resolution of some of these issues. Uh, if if there's not compliance, the next normal step would be for us to write up the case and refer it to the city attorney for a potential for their consideration of violations of the rent stabilization ordinance and further enforcement. Um, what is the timeline for you to do that in this case? I would say in September. So within 30 days. It's right now. Right now. You yes. will be submitting it. Um, that's kind of a summary of where we are with the Ellis. There was other requests for information in the motion, more on the code enforcement side. And if you are interested in uh, some of that information, Mr. Gallardi can provide that. Yes. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Ms. Ortega. Um, committee members, thank you again for uh, our opportunity this afternoon. Um, we did do a preliminary review of all the code violations related to uh, Barrington Towers looking back 10 years. We found there is currently no open orders of code violations on Barrington Towers, not one. In addition, we found that over the past 10 years, we've conducted two systematic code enforcement program inspections. That's our door-to-door -door inspection programs. Both were closed. It would, um, with compliance and through the 10 years we found we received 94 complaints of of which we issued 15 orders to comply so over 10 years let's just call it 110 complaints per year from Barrington Towers which resulted in about 1.5 orders per year so um, there's really 
um, nothing indicating that they were uh, a bad operator or a bad actor regarding their uh, requirements to comply with the code enforcement of any type for that property over the past 10 years. Um, in addition, I just wanted to follow up. Um, Council Member Blumenfeld asked me specifically at our last meeting regarding the THP, um, how the THP could or does apply to this property. Um, when, if in fact this property, Barrington Towers, becomes 100% vacant over in a year, what is it, May 8th, 2024, there'll be no occupants in the building. If there's no occupants in the building, there will be no tenant habitability program plan required because the tenant habitability plan is there to protect the in-place tenants in the building through this, what we refer to as primary renovation um, that's, that's planned for this property, specifically the sprinkler retrofit. Going back to the fire that occurred in 2013, um, there was, the fire was contained to two floors. Those two floors were basically vacated. Um, those tenants were looking at the record. Those tenants were relocated to somewhere else in, within the community in that community, and therefore a THP was not required for the fire in 2013 due to the area for which the work was being done was vacant and unoccupied. So that's, that's, that's the nuance to the THP committee members. It's there to protect the tenants in place, but if we don't have a tenant in place, um, there's really no mechanism for the prime tenant habitability program to function. I hope that better answers your, your questions, uh, I, I council members. I think the additional question was for the current repair work that they are doing to retrofit the sprinkler system. That it, I thought that was the question that was asked, was for the sprinkler system work, how would the tenant habitability program be applicable to it? So in the case where they were not following through with the Ellis on this property and the tenants were still in place, we would require that they provide the department some tenant, tenant habitability program plan. That plan would schedule or illustrate the mechanism in which they were going to temporarily or either short term or long term relocate those residents while the work's being performed. This work that's planned, in our, my judgment, as far as the sprinkler retrofit and the exterior cladding of the building, would definitely require that the tenants in some way or some form be either temporarily or long-term relocated under a THP if in fact the tenants were in place. Okay. Let's follow up on that. You wanna follow up? I wanna make sure that we have an opportunity. Is that the completion, is that your full report? Or is there other? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's it for the code enforcement relating to the housing department. I do have my colleagues here from building and safety for some uh, additional questions that uh, Council Member Blumenfeld had last time. Okay, um, could we move to the city attorney? Um, All that I can say is that the, this office is monitoring the, um, the relocation process and, and the lawsuits that some of the tenants have brought um, against the, the owners um, and We'll consider referrals from the housing department as they come in. You were also asked in the council, um, in the motion, um, which was amended in this committee, uh, the city attorney was asked to uh, identify potential interventions in the process to ensure that residents are not per uh, permanently displaced from, from the site. And so if you could speak to that question, that was, the, that was what the city attorney was asked. Ellis Act allows the owner to do these evictions. Um, if there are issues with, with how um, it, the state law gives the city some remedies, if there are issues with um, how they eventually return the units to the market. Um, and those are specified under state law. Um, if there are interventions at that point that we can make, um, those are certainly things we can consider. Um, but there's, we can't say at this point um, whether or not there's something we can do in the middle of the process. Okay. 
Okay, so I have some follow-up questions for this, which also, I think, pertains to how Ellis functions here. So I'm gonna start off with my own questions and then we can move to other uh, committee members' questions. This, uh, to my knowledge, this is the largest Ellis filing in the city's history, largest number of tenants impacted in a single Ellis filing, is that right? That's correct. Did LAHD seek city attorney counsel or other counsel on how to process this application? Does it traditionally seek city attorney counsel on how to process Ellis applications, particularly instances where the, the filing documentation says that the next step for the property is unknown or undecided? We don't normally uh, consult with the city attorney. The, they're, the, there's established, an established process for this and a lot of um, ordinance provisions. In this case, we did. Uh, because we had some questions, we knew it was very big. You did seek out the city attorney's counsel. We did. Uh, we knew it would be controversial. We didn't have, when we accepted the filing in May, all of the reports that came later. I will say that. What but, are those reports that you're referring to? Um, articles in the press, statements by the property owner uh, about the future work and what their intent was. We, we didn't have that when when the filing was uh, delivered to the housing department. The future, um, the reports that you're referring to talked about uh, essentially the property owner stating that they didn't know what the next kind of, the next steps were in terms of how they were planning to use the property and, and talked about how they wanted to re-rent, potentially re-rent the properties, right? Which is, Ellis Act is really designed to remove uh, units from the rental market. Um, and, and some of these public statements talked about refilling these units with new tenants, right? Correct. They're filing, there's various choices, but the, they chose the box that said undecided. Right. So what sort of protections does the city have under the RSO, which I think is an additional local protection um, in addition to the state Ellis uh, what protections do tenants have under the RSO that are, you know, that add on to what, what the procedurals are from the Ellis Act? Were those fully exercised here before the Ellis Act was, uh, uh, eviction was approved? Um, and I'm particularly curious about the good faith requirements that the RSO has, um, that people are acting in good faith, that they are, and, and you know, acting in, in kind of in line with the spirit of, of these laws. So w during the last few weeks and months when we've, ex we've been processing the filing and um, notifying the tenants about their rights, we're trying to get information out to the tenants that they need to know about, you know, how to request uh, the extension, th how to file their right to return. We don't, at, we wouldn't at this point have information that would allow us to ascertain the property owner's good faith. There's not a process for that. Um, there are protections if the property owner puts the units back on the rental market, and that is that the tenants have the right to return, and they have the right to return at their former rent, plus any allowable rent increases if that happens within five years of the removal. And so we have record keeping and data to help us notify the tenants and keep track of the tenants who have expressed an interest in returning. Did you want to speak to that, Ms. Song? Yeah, I mean, may, may I add to that? Um, so in court filings, um, Douglas Emmett and Barrington Plaza has represented to the court that um, they haven't, they, 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 their future use is undecided. That's what they've represented to the court. Um, and they've also represented to the court that, that this, this process can take four to seven years. Um, under the Ellis Act, if, if units are returned within two years, for example, or f within five years, um, there are remedies that, that tenants can seek and that um, the city can pursue. Um, just wanted to add that. And so, so just so I understand, because I'm not a, a lawyer, um, you're saying that the good faith requirement of the RSO, the only, the way in which you would understand that to have been violated is if the owners bring those units back to the market 
before the five-year period is done. That's the only way that you have, to, that's the only means you have to test that. We don't have a good way to test that, and in fact, the, the words good faith are nowhere in the Ellis provisions of the RSO. Mm -hmm. But it is somewhere in the RSO. <laughs> <laughs> It's part of our rent stabilization ordinance. Yes, evictions need to be done for good, in a, in a good faith manner. So one of the legal reasons for eviction is for permanent removal of the rental housing market or for demolition of the rental property. But you don't know it at this point. You don't know it when it gets filed. You might see it after the actions are carried out or not carried out. Okay. Um, so how is LHD engaging in the relocation process between the landlord and the tenants? Like you're saying that you're, I hear you that you're responding to questions that are coming in to you. Um, and I hear that there is a relocation service that Barrington is using for, um, for this process. What is LAHD's actual role in the process then? Are you on site? Are you no, proactively we're not, we're not sending out notices to tenants? Is there, is there some outreach that you're doing or is it responding to incoming questions exclusively? No, we do notify the tenants up front as soon as the landlord files that this is happening, that the city has a relocation services provider, what their name is, that they can expect to be contacted by them, what we're doing in those early stages, and all of that is pretty much done now, is um, figuring out uh, what level of relocation assistance t the tenants are entitled to, because it depends on um, how long they've lived there, what their income is, whether they have children, whether someone's disabled, whether somebody's a senior. So the amounts range from, I don't know the l lower one so well, 9,000 9, or so to almost 20, 3,000. Um, so we introduce the tenant, we give them information about what they can expect and introduce the relocation services provider who then works um, to determine what the correct amount of relocation is. There's also the ability for tenants and the landlord to appeal the amount of relocation that's determined. And so as I mentioned, we have had 60 appeals about the relocation amount. But pretty much those appeals have all taken place already. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't see the relocation payment as, uh, as controversial an issue, though it is for those that um, have appealed. But that has functioned as it, it's designed to. Is LHD or DBS going to be actively monitoring activities on an ongoing basis, so for example, will you be monitoring what's happening at the site even as this one year extension period is happening? Are you gonna be monitoring retrofitting activities um, at, the, at the site as it moves forward? Is that part of your scope of uh, responsibilities? We would monitor um, the continued um, the continued services for the tenants and we also monitor the clearing of any permits so before we clear, let, this is not a demolition, but before we clear any permit, uh, it, would, it would be referred to LAHDs and we could, so that we can ensure, for instance, that all of the tenants that were supposed to get the relocation received it. The tenants have also been giving inf given information about the, the, their entitlement to relocation services and if any tenant felt that they did not receive the full relocation that they're entitled to, they can file a complaint with us and we would investigate that. There's a number of things that we could potentially refer to the city attorney, including, as I mentioned, the reduction in services for the gym, mm -hmm. um, possibly is issues about tenants that are due um, an extension of the tenancy and failure to pay the full relocation. Okay, one of the things that I think has been challenging for tenants, because they've been giving public testimony here in this committee for a few weeks now, and we've, there's been quite a bit written about this issue in the press, um, is that it feels to many tenants and many outside observers that the full 
removal of all tenants through an Ellis process was not required to do the kind of work that they're describing that they're planning to be doing at, at Barrington Plaza. Is there a, a way in which the city can, um, you know, can, can, can gauge whether the reasons provided for the Ellis are justification enough to evict all of these tenants? Is that part of your process? And if not, is there a way to make that part of your oversight process in the Ellis Act? I don't think that exists now, to be honest, because under the Ellis Act, a property owner doesn't have to give us a reason. And in this case, they said undecided. So, I mean, we can monitor um, the process and continue to work with the city attorney, but the reasons for which an Ellis is allowed are pretty broad. Uh, again, there's penalties if they return the units within two years and five years. So we'll definitely be f monitoring those timelines. Um, and I might ask the city attorney to speak to this question as well. Is, this, is there a way for the city to be more interventionist in monitoring how the Ellis Act is being utilized in these kinds of situations? such as in cases where it feels like the nature of the work is not extensive enough to require removal of all tenants for a period of five years. Um, is, is there ways to, for example, change our oversight processes over how Ellis is implemented, change our forms, change the way in which we think about how we, um, how we oversee uh, 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 these properties and, and, and how they move through the Ellis process that will allow us to have more leverage um, to push us in a better direction here? I, I can, I can um, read you what the Ellis Act says. Okay? Um, it says, no public entity shall by statute, ordinance, or regulation um, compel the owner of any residential real property to offer or continue to offer accommodations in the property. That's, that's, what, it, that's what the Ellis Act says. Then there are certain procedural mechanisms that cities can adopt, um, such as relocation, requiring relocation, um, giving extended tenancies um, to certain classes of tenants. Um, that's all prescribed in, in the Ellis Act. The Ellis Act tells us what kinds of regulations were allowed as a city to adopt. And that's what's my understanding is, you know, how we adopted the Ellis Act provisions in the RSO. Um, there may be... Um, no, please hold on. Do you mind letting her finish and then, yeah. Go ahead. Um, in, in, so, in so far as, you know, if you want to, um, in, you know, require more relocation assistance, those are all policy decisions that, that city council can make. Um, but, but the Ellis Act does specify things that cities are allowed to adopt when, when, um, when an Ellis, uh, when an owner decides to, to quote unquote Ellis the property. I've given this a lot of thought. Um, I, think, I think one thing that we really need to explore is whether we can eliminate the undecided option and require, require a stated intent. Mm -hmm. Perhaps even, I mean, maybe undecided is okay for a duplex, <laughs> but for larger properties, surely the property owner knows what they intend to do. Uh, so I, I would certainly like to explore that with the city attorney. Great. So I think it's definitely worth looking into. Um, and then finally, I guess I would, I would have two, two other questions. One is really building on this. Do you feel like we have utilized our full regulatory authority provided to us under the Ellis Act? to ensure that, you know, buildings are, 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 are being impacted really for the purposes of the Ellis Act itself, or are there ways like what Ms. Ortega is suggesting um, that we change, besides the change from potentially t removing an, uh, um, an undecided option, are there other ways in which we could change our regulatory role here 
so that we can exercise more authority or more control. And this would be for both the city attorney and for LAHD. The city, the LAMC Ellis provisions almost in exactly mirror the state law. So we're, our hands are really tied as to what's there. I, I mean, I think we can perhaps report back on additional put, uh, options, but if you read the, the, the state uh, legislation and the city ordinance, they're, they're almost exactly. We, we actually, we've amended our Alice provisions a number of times over the years. The last time was in 2017, and we were trying then to close loopholes, and we, we added some additional provisions. Um, for instance, we do require that landlords file Ellis applications, uh, Ellis notifications for vacant units because the, the way the state law is written, it's, it really only talks about occupied, occupied units, but you lose a lot of units. Right. They get vacant somehow through tenant buyouts or whatever, and that means that we lose RSO units. So we have, we have amended it um, in every way we could think of to close loopholes, but we, we can look again although, again, we're prescribed by the provisions of state law. Ms. Ong? Yeah, it's certainly something that we would work with the housing department to explore. Okay, um, and finally, I guess I would just say it sounds like there are changes needed in the state law that will help us regulate this much more effectively at the local level um, to ensure that we're preserving and protecting as much affordable housing here in Los Angeles. How can we lobby for those changes? What's the best avenue to do that? Have we done that in the past? We have through, uh, I believe through the CLA in um, annual bills that, uh, that are proposed that the city supports and uh, we do from time to time support legislation. I think a key one would also be the idea about if an extended tenancy is granted to a tenant that it should be granted to the all the building. tenants. Okay. That would be a big one. Okay. Okay. Um, those are all my questions for the moment. Do other committee members have questions? Mr. Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before I get to some of my uh, more specific questions about this policy, more, I heard you say earlier the need to show a W-9. Is that something the city, I believe you said that that's something that the the building, the property owner is asking for a W-9. Is that so? That's not a normal. Is 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 relocation considered an income? We advise people to talk to their tax preparer. Um, we have seen rulings where it's not considered income, and and in most cases, landlords pay the full relocation assistance amount without any W-9 or anything else. In this case, the property owner's attorney has advised that they um, have reviewed the law and they believe that they are obligated and have the responsibility to withhold for taxes. Okay, so they're withholding taxes. That was, that was one of my other questions. And is, I know we had a lot of people speak and I can't remember uh, if there were different people asking and speaking in different languages. Are we providing, or does the city, does the tenant, uh, the property owner, are they providing any translation services to make sure that everyone is understanding the rules, that everyone is understanding what is happening regarding their rights? Um, I'll, I'll answer that question. So um, in the beginning of the process, we did uh, notify all of the tenants in writing um, that the Ellis forms had been filed. We sent that letter in English and in Spanish. We also sent that letter as requested in other, language, in other languages, such as, um, I believe it was uh, Farsi, um, and, and offered to translate that letter to any language that any tenant uh, requested, which, which we did. Um, I think there was also a Russian translation of the, of the material. Okay, so I remember both fires. So it's my understanding that if they would have had a sprinkler system, the, the fire may not have been totally prevented, but it would not have spread. Isn't that what we have determined 
through our city investigations. Is, anybody can speak to that. Member Lee, yes, in regards to the sprinkler, fire sprinkler, it would have been a great su suppression element to suppress the fire from spreading. Okay, so now in line with current laws, are relo relocation fees, are they being paid? In, in line with what we have on the books? Yes, okay, except so for the 24% deduction from the people that won't give them the W-9, but yes. So the, it, as in your words, it's functioning as it was designed to, correct? Yeah, they are, yes, the relocation assistance is being paid as the RSO requires. So right now, I know we're talking about some future things that they have to be given the ability to have first rights uh, of coming back. But as of now, are they violating anything? They, they aren't paying the full relocation to certain tenants. Okay. They are disputing that certain tenants have the right to an extended stay of one year. Um, so we're still working through that. Um, they imposed a rent reduction on tenants and they are thus far refusing to provide uh, a rent reduction for those units. That would be an illegal, in effect, an illegal rent increase. So you're saying, you're saying that they have violated something. They, there are certain things that that they are not in full compliance. We believe. With but nothing. We're, but we're working through that process, right? The ones that want a year extension, the ones, some of the different things that you're saying. There's a process that we're going through with them that possibly is possible that they violate us things, and I'm, I'm hopeful that if they find out that. They are in the wrong, that they will then fix that issue. We're hopeful too, and okay. we've, we've met with their attorney, we've exchanged lists, we've asked for clarifications, we've asked for a full list of every tenant and what their status, what their move out date is. Um, they are following, technically they're following the letter of the law uh, as far as what's in the RSO. So I understand that there are members of this committee that have questions regarding should we be doing certain things. As a council, as this committee, we set the policy of the city of Los Angeles. I know that state comes to, down to us and then we can add different things, but we set that policy. And if people are following that policy, I just don't understand why we keep having this conversation. If they're following the policy, and if we think it needs to have be stronger, if we think that it needs to, we need to put more things, as you stated, you know, for duplex maybe saying, uh, you know, uh, I forgot what the word it is that you, you used, that you were un uh, that you did not know what, what you were going to be using it as. That's something we, we definitely should, I agree. We should be looking into that maybe that is not, is not okay past a certain amount of units. I think as a city, we, as policymakers, we should set that. But as of now, that is a perfectly suitable answer as far as what's under the Ellis Act. That's correct, Councilman. Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you. I think the question that questions that have come up about this have really come up because the Ellis Act was designed to allow property owners to exit the rental market, um, and it when it was proposed, it was really around mom and pop owners who wanted to stop being landlords and move back into their units. The use of the Ellis Act in such a big property, when the owners have talked multiple times about wanting to release the properties and go back into the rental market with the same units, seems to be a slap in the face to tenants who are struggling, who have been living in these units for decades, um, in one of the most expensive neighborhoods in the city uh, and paying rents that, are, that have been controlled for many years by the RSO. These are scarce units. Uh, and at a time when we're struggling to stem um, our affordable housing loss, I think this does feel like a pretty big issue. I think it's worth discussing, worth talking about what are the tools that we have at our disposal to be oh. able to address it. I understand 
that this is the rules that we're dealing with right now, but I think it's worth discussing it. That's all. No one is questioning, are there problems with it? You know, no one's, no one's saying, like, of course. I think this instance has brought up a lot of different holes that we as a council need to address and we need to like, take a look into. But this is not the, the fault of the owner that is, you know, if they are following the Ellis Act, if they're following the different things, if they're doing what was put forth by the state and by the city, then they are complying. That's all I'm saying is that I'm not saying is, is there, is, are there things that we've pointed out today? Yes, absolutely. And I think, Ms. Roman, in this committee, we're going to address, I know we're going to address those issues. I'm, I'm certain that we're going to, every little thing that we found out that's a problem with this, we are going to fix that problem. But as of right now, if someone is, if we set the policy, if we set the rules, and people play by those rules, I, I don't understand how we then can create barriers for them. Well, we're, we're, we're yeah. just talking. We're just talking. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. harris -Hawson. Thank you, and I, and I, uh, I, I appreciate uh, the, the points that Mr. Lee uh, raised. I would say, one, the Ellis Act is not city policy. It's state policy. Mm -hmm. So we didn't That's set right. the policy. We have to live by the policy. It is also true, anybody who studied the history knows that the Ellis Act was not designed to pick to um, apply to large apartment building owners. In fact, the makeup of who owned apartments at the time of the Ellis Act was entirely different than it is today. And so th the reason why I'll continue to ask questions and continue to confront is clearly what's happening here is a person is walking the letter of the law or an institution is walking the letter of the law, as you all have pointed out. There's no law breaking that we know of. But it's such a blatant and clear violation of the spirit of the law. Like, it's so obvious. And so we could sit and say, oh, well, they found a loophole, and they're going to drive a Mack truck through it, so we say nothing and we do nothing. I, I, I reject that. I say we, we do everything we possibly can. It sounds like you all have done it. And again, we may not be able to stop it. I, I mean, one of my big critiques about tenant, uh, tenancy laws in the state of California is they treat, it treats duplex owners like multinational corporations and vice versa. It tr we treat the people who own Park La Brea the same as my neighbor that has an I ADU. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, and so uh, again, I, it feels like you all have done the work, but it, the onus is not on us to be silent or congratulatory to someone who is so clearly, at least in my opinion, so clearly violating the spirit of the law and the intent of the law. We are in a homeless emergency. The idea that someone would pursue an eviction this aggressive and this large is something that we ought to say something about. And I want to make sure I'm on the record and saying <laughs> I, I'm not going to be silent about it. I'm not going to pat them on the back. I'm not going to congratulate them for following the law. Thank you, no, Mr. harris Austin. No, I couldn't agree more. Mr. Lee. No one, no one is saying that we're, you know, if you, if, if you feel that if anyone on this committee feels that way. I'm saying that this council constantly makes decisions without understanding certain issues of how they affect when we make issues about businesses. We don't, we're, not, we're not looking into their books. I feel over and over that we are overstepping our bounds. You can have your opinion. You can have say, you know, whether, you know, you know, if these people are doing it right or wrong or whatever. I don't know. All I know is that they have had two fires there. They're trying to put in a sprinkler system. And no one here has yet said, well, they can keep, they can keep the first, I don't, I don't even know how many floors. They can keep these floors, but they can continue to do this. It, 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 for us to just sit here and say, like, well, we know, I, we know that, they, that they're doing they're doing X, Y, and Z. I don't know that. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a, an expert in fire sprinkler systems. I, all I know is that I've heard from reports given is that if we had spr sprinkler systems in that building, that that fire wouldn't have spread. And if this owner's making the decision that they need to move forward with those fire sprinklers, 
and that they say that they need to do this to they they have to evict the whole entire area I, I'm waiting for someone to say that that's not the case so until that until it's shown to me whether it's spirit of law or anything I'm not an expert in that okay thank you mr. Lee they, they, they um, could they could they could today this afternoon guarantee a right of return when the repairs are done it would solve this whole problem at the same rate that the tenants are paying right now yeah they could okay um, well thank you for your inputs here oh you have questions mr. Bloomfield yeah okay go ahead <laughs> I'll try to be brief. I mean, you asked most of the questions in, in your opening comments and uh, questions where I was going. But I, two, two things. One, I just wanted to, to focus a little more on the good faith issue. And I, and I know I appreciate. And, and first off, I really appreciate LA, uh, the housing really trying to do everything they can uh, for the tenants. And that's noticed and appreciated. Uh, it's a horrible situation, as we're, we're, we're referencing here, where we're seeing all these folks being evicted. Um, but the good faith, if there were, we can't, you know, question that they say they're undecided. But if somebody did come forward with a smoking gun, uh, a signed document showing that they actually aren't undecided, that they have a plan, X, Y, and Z, what would the relevancy of that, would, would we be able to take that into consideration or do they have to go to court to take that into consideration? I'm saying, I understand on the face of it, it is what it is, but should there be a smoking gun out there? Uh, saying that it's actually been well decided, how would that play? I think if we had ev evidence that smoking gun, we would consult with the city attorney and, uh, and, and utilize some of the good faith provisions of the, over, of the RSO in general. I mean, we haven't had such a case, but... I, okay, I guess that's what I'm... Because I've heard that there are, there are some smoking guns out there in terms of... Uh, their intentions of what they plan to do. And, and I know that good faith is not in the Ellis Act. It is in the RSO, so it's, it's complicated. But, uh, but it's good to hear that there's maybe something with the city attorney. I don't know if the city attorney has any comments on that. Should there be a, a smoking gun, or does it go to the courts? Because, you know. Yeah, is there, is there an opportunity for us to utilize a smoking gun if we had one? Um, and I think this is a question for the city attorney. I mean, this is, this is kind of going into our legal strategy if, if this were to come up that um, we would discuss with the housing department. Okay. So just put that out there and, and anyone who has smoking guns, bring them, bring them forward. Uh, and then the DBS, we, where I was wanted to follow up, and I appreciate very much what you were saying. It, it feels, though, that like this is, there's a loophole here, you know, that, that we've, Kind of exposed it, or, or it's been exposed that if, if you you don't have to have the tenant habitability plan if you evict everybody, is there any way uh, that we could close that loophole? I mean, loophole may be the wrong word, but but it just seems that um, it, it's problematic as a as a as a an avenue that people can go down, not just this uh, landlord, but but future landlords to be able to avoid the tenant habitability by, by evicting folks, by not having any tenants, essentially. Um, the way that the statute's currently drafted, um, council member, no. The way that what's drafted? The, 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 the statute, the tenant habitability program, section 152 of That's the a city. LAMC. So, so potentially there may be some recommendations of how we could redraft that? Well, you have to remember that the tenant habitability program circles or rotates around an occupied unit. So without an occupied unit, we don't have a plan. Right. Sort of a circular problem. I don't know the answer to it, but I, I feel I'm trying to see where, where there might be ways that we can engage on that. Not necessarily that it would impact this situation, but future situations. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there because I know we've spent a lot of time, uh, even though I only asked two questions. Go ahead. 
Okay, well, thank you. I think this is a, you know, for me, it has been a very frustrating situation watching this play out um, and seeing that we may be, by the letter of the law, limited in how we can take action. Uh, but I think this is a situation that is worthy of continued consideration of how we can take action. Um, and I think, I think we should, um, we should continue to look at some of the changes that you're, con you're uh, proposing, Ms. Ortega. Um, I think we should continue to discuss this. I want to hold this in the committee. Um, ideally, I would like to see a written report be submitted, um, and we would need to see regular updates as the relocation process is moving on. And so I'm going to be a little bit more specific than uh, Councilmember Park even was, which is uh, I would like to see the numbers on, on relocation, who's, who's allowed to stay, um, how much relocation they're being offered, and I'd like to see that data regularly documented over time. And so if we can bring this back to, I think, probably in a month to this committee, um, for an update on what's happening uh, and a further exploration of some of the questions that we talked about today in terms of um, forms in the Ellis Act uh, and how those could be altered. I think that would be really useful to have you all come back in a month on that issue. Does that sound good? Okay, great. Thank you all. Let's move on to item six which is uh, about ADUs. Do you want to read that item into the record? Thank you. Item number six is a city administrative officer and Los Angeles Housing Department reports relative to the feasibility of creating a pilot program to house formerly homeless Angelinos in accessory dwelling units and creating an ADU financing pilot program. Okay, great. Thank you. We have folks from LAHD here. We have folks from CAO here, delightful crew. Um, and I think there's some clarifications that both departments wanted to address up top. So if you wanted to introduce yourselves and provide your report and any additional clarifications, I think that would be great. So good afternoon. Good afternoon, I'm, I'm Yolanda Chavez with the CEO's office. Um, I'm gonna start just with a brief overview and then I'll uh, Move it over to my colleague with my colleagues with the housing department. So the goal of the CEO report before you was to clarify the LHD report dated June 1st, 2023, which recommends two programs: an ADU rental program and an ADU financial incentive program, which pro which would provide construction financing to low and moderate income homeowners. The LHD has clarified that the ADU rental program is not only for households um, at risk of homelessness, but also for households that are experiencing homelessness and are low acuity with their only main need being affordable housing. This program would be open to participants that have a time limited subsidy of two years. On the financial incentive program for um, low and moderate income homeowners to construct ADUs, the, the housing department has asked to make changes to the program structure attached to the CAO report that they have provided. They had asked that we go back to the June 1st report and approve their attachment in the initial report, but we pointed out there were some inconsistencies in that attachment that had to be corrected. I want to point out that um, the two key questions we asked the department on the financial incentive uh, program was, one, what is the goal of the program? To increase housing inventory or to also provide affordable units given in exchange for the financial incentive? So the one question we asked, because their initial report had only a proposal to allow these homeowners to rent to households up to 120%. One of the questions we asked is, would you provide an incentive so that maybe these homeowners can provide the unit to households at 80 or below 80% of AMI to ensure more affordability by providing some loan forgiveness? Given that the housing department wants to restructure the program and correct some of the 
the um, program guidelines and loan terms based on what they provided to us as um, is outlined in the attachment to the CEO report. We would recommend that you allow the housing department to come back with the final program guidelines for the next H&H &H meeting so that, so that we can move forward on both programs. Um, and with that, I will to my colleague at the housing department. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, I'm Trisha Keene, executive officer of the housing department. Um, here with members of our team, we're certainly happy to answer any questions and are very interested in getting the committee's feedback um, and any direction, you know, based on the discussion here today that, as Ms. Chavez noted, we would be prepared to come back with some updated recommendations and clarifications to resolve what seem like some of the um, discrepancies between a couple of the approaches that were noted in the record for you. Um, but I think it's important to note you know, the goal of the accessory dwelling unit program, as was mentioned, you know, is something that council has been uh, considering for a while. And we want to make sure that we have clarity on the policies that we're trying to achieve with this because you know, this is, could be an important pilot to demonstrate proof of concept for some of the things that have been discussed about how ADUs could be you know, both an additional source of housing stock for a population, an, an AMI percentage, honestly, that isn't served by a lot of our programs. The 80 to 120 percent AMI is not something that is incentivized or provided through other sources of financing, since most of those sources of financing target much deeper levels of affordability for very good reasons. So this could be a good pilot test case for whether this is an appropriate structure to incentivize both that kind of development um, for tenant households who would live in them and for the homeowners who could potentially develop them and how that could benefit both sides of that tenant and homeowner equation. So we are happy to, we're here to answer any questions and you know, happy to hear your feedback today. Great, thank you. Um, I had one question to kick us off, which is about the structure of this particular program. I know it's supposed to be intending to target seniors, right? So, and, and I will certainly ask um, either Greg or Eric to chime in on anything that I miss, but there was an initial program that targeted seniors that sort of kick-started the idea behind the ability to use ADUs for target populations. And so this was an outgrowth of that pilot to see whether serving people who are experiencing homelessness but low acuity would also be a good target population for the housing typology that's available through an ADU, which is very different than what's available through like a permanent supportive housing intervention. Okay, yeah, that's helpful because for me, I was looking at the target population of seniors and the use of time limited subsidies, which suggests that at some point the person will increase their capacity to earn money. And for seniors, that's very unlikely to be the case. And so it felt like a little bit of a program misfit uh, but it sounds like that's not going to, that's not the focus of the program design. That Correct. was just the initial population. Yeah, that was a spark for the idea of it, okay. but not the target of this particular program. So I do want to stress that that still would be a challenge given that the target population for this pilot and use the ADU rental program is still for households that are at risk of homelessness or homeless and low acuity. So that's still a risk in terms of income. Right. So there has to be a solution after the two-year time-limited subsidy right. terminates. Right. But the time-limited subsidies are often utilized for people who are experiencing homelessness who may need that two-year period. So I think it's, it's a common intervention in those cases. Mm -hmm. But Okay. Great. Other questions? Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. As part of it, I think the confusion is a couple of ideas have been merged. There is the, the accelerator program, like with one generation, that we've worked with closely, which is a great way to get vulnerable seniors into ADUs. Uh, and then when I brought this motion forward, the idea was originally to um, create a, an incentive for folks who may not be able to afford an ADU to, to build that ADU, but it would be subsidized. And in return for the subsidy, you would, in the initial idea, you would basically be agreeing to master lease that unit to someone who was formerly homeless. And then that's sort of a number of reasons that folks uh, have 
said that may not be as feasible, but maybe there's something there where we could incentivize folks to create more housing stock, as you pointed out, it is one of the key goals, but uh, to do it in a way that would actually um, provide housing stock for low income folks, create affordable housing at a rate that's a lot cheaper than the affordable housing that we build everywhere else. Uh, the difference, of course, when you build a big apartment building, uh, you got to put in all those extra plumbing and everything else, and you can do an ADU one a one-off unit much cheaper. But you don't ha you don't have the density, so it's it's harder to have the high acuity folks. But it is a population that we can uh, deal with in finding a, a financial incentive program. But we don't want to just do this and give away money to a few folks uh, so they can build an ADU and then you know have a, a, an extra room in their house or an extra office. So, so part of the, you know, what are the guide rails that we, guard rails that we can put on this to make sure that the population that is being served, uh, that is renting those units really has, is the right population, whether they're covenants or other ways to incentivize, because it's very hard to enforce this stuff as well. So, so one of the things that you may want to recommend to the department is that instead of providing an incentive is that they make it mandatory. So if a homeowner receives a $150,000 loan and a $40,000 grant, 3% simple interest, 20-year term that is payable when they sell or refinance or 20 years, that in exchange they rent to someone at either below 80 or between 80 and 120 percent of AMI, and maybe there's some loan forgiveness to give more to provide the incentive to rent to lower income households. The way you control it, and I would leave that to the city attorney, but it's through a deed of trust that if they violate those that agreement, then you then they go into default. So there are ways to control it without putting a 30-year covenant on a single-family property that would really be a disincentive for most homeowners. It would be disincentive, and, and frankly, the city is never going to oh, foreclose on someone, exactly. a low-income person who is defaulting on their second uh, tier. So, but I do like the, I mean, the original idea when I put this forward was mandatory. It wasn't just creating an incentive. So I'm... Personally, I like the mandatory side of it, or at least having those guardrails be a lot stronger, because in, in, in the language I'm looking at, the guardrails don't seem that strong. And, and council member, we would be happy to return with some recommendations that get at the ability to enforce and ensure that the target population is being served by this, but also um, don't accidentally create a disincentive and make it a program that homeowners don't want to participate in. Right, and, and I mean, as a pilot, I mean, what are we piloting for, I guess, is the question. And I look at this, I mean, because if you just look at it on its face, it ain't worth it for 19 units to do all of this work and to create this bureaucracy. It's worth it if we are carving a pathway where we can then connect with ULA and we can and, and create opportunities to do something on a larger scale to create affordable housing and to create these opportunities. So. What are we piloting for in this, in your, in your view? I guess I'll put that out there, because there's, you raise a lot of questions of what we could be, but. Well, I would suggest that we're piloting to see if the incentives provided in the final program are enough to get homeowners to do this. And in this current financial market, it may be, right? And if it's successful, then, you know, maybe you continue that with ULA. But I think you want to test it right, and test the kind of program you want for the outcomes you want. If it's not only increasing housing inventory, but also creating some affordable units, if that's the goal, then let's test it for that. Right, and, and matching people who are experiencing the homelessness and figuring all that out. And then I guess another thing is putting in safeguards. Uh, I was involved with the creation of the PACE program at the state level. And there's some, this is reminiscent of that to some extent. And the PACE program was, was uh, also financial incentives, but for water conservation, energy conservation, ultimately for earthquake as well. Um, and it's a great program to unlock capital to do a lot of building. Uh, however, there were problems um, because, uh, because some unscrupulous contractors 
took advantage of it and um, and you are even though it's not it's a secondary lien it's still a lien and it, it causes issues so a I think we could lo look at the pace program and some of the safeguards that have been since added uh, as a model to create some safeguards but but what kind of safeguards do you see putting in uh, to prevent the defaults and, and that kind of thing so the housing department is proposing to hire an administrator for the program Right, so depending on that administrator, the RFP, once you finalize the program, the RFP can also have some safeguards to ensure that the administrator that is selected to manage the program is ensuring that the safeguards are, are, are met. So that's definitely one way to do that because it would be implemented by the contractor that is selected through the RFP. Okay, and also, can, can you share the role of the Community Development Financial Institution, CDFI, and how they'll help with the ADU financing? Yes, so you're remembering that there's the two separate components to the way that a we're gonna pilot some ADU options. In the financing, the construction loan, essentially, um, uh, option or program, that would be done where there would be procurement of a lending partner that would help provide construction loans, which are typically riskier and higher interest rate, that could be matched with our leveraged funds to provide permanent loans for when the construction is done and there needs to be the ongoing mortgage called a takeout loan, to take out your construction loan, turn it into permanent financing. Um, another possible approach in that context for qualified households would be to do a combined construction to permanent loan, which is an easier uh, financing process. Well, that's like, yeah, it's one thing, construction loans for big projects yes. happens all the time. For individuals doing housing, that seems Yes, um, but the, the lending partners, so the CDFI's other lending partners that could potentially participate in this would help us find leveraged money so that we could make city resources go farther and we could serve as that takeout loan or the construction to permanent loan bridge for qualified households. So I think that's where that contractor or lending partner really comes into play on that program. And then the administrator or contractor that would be retained that Ms. Chavez was um, referencing would really be working in the realm of the leasing program too. Right. Or in and I was actually referring to the construction administrator. Got it, okay. The construction yes. loan administrator. Got it. Potentially of, of, of the RFP that we would at least continue working on would be to keep the program guidelines broad enough to really explore what kind of financial instruments lenders could bring to the table and what the market will actually bring to the table in terms of creativity on this. Great. Okay. Great. Any other questions, Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Um, <clears throat> What have we seen in the level of permitting for people seeking to build ADUs? So remembering my days back with the planning department, right. where the rate of ADU construction prior to state law changes was, I will not get this number correct, but it would have been like 600 units over years. Um, and Eric might remember even better detail than me. It turned into many more than that per year. Um, I don't know what the most updated numbers are, but it is definitely something that... Wait, you said in the state? Yes, yeah, so there's a change in state law several years ago that... Right. Oh, okay, but, I, but in, in our city, so in the city you said we... we preceding it, we were at about 600. 600, like over the course of there many being years. the possibility... Correct. ...of doing this to easily double or triple that per year. Right. Um, so, so people really were taking advantage of the opportunities created, but... There is also you know, difficulty for some demographics to, uh, to have access to the financing to do it. Right. And I think this is in recognition that people for whom financing is easy to access were able to take advantage of it quickly. Sure. Well, the interest rates and the, the terms were a lot better, uh, you know, even just in the last couple of years. So the financials that we're talking about, I would, I would guess, uh, that the pre-development is frankly part of the obstruction for the most part uh, in terms of what is obstructing mm -hmm. the process for a lot of households. 
Um, but I would say secondarily to that, one of the things that I worry about, and I understand, look, we're trying to throw everything at our housing crisis. Uh, our biggest fundamental problem is we're losing to uh, the Airbnbs of the world. And, you know, but we're gonna continue to exhaust our hotel supply for other means, then all we're gonna do is open up the floodgates for incentives for individuals to continue to exhaust efforts for Airbnbs. So, you know, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul here. This is a constant cycle that we continue to spiral into. Um, I guess given the new financing terms that we're talking about, I know the pre-development is, is going to be uh, most constructive, but I also worry about, honestly, uh, you know, we can talk about this uh, two-year, uh, you know, the, the subsidies and, and all of these other things, but what I also worry about are the implications of the individuals that perhaps might exhaust or perhaps uh, resist moving forward with uh, rental properties given some of the laborious methods of our of rental protections. And I think that's gonna be, that's gonna cause some consternation for a lot of folks to make that type of investment. So uh, in terms of the pre-designed or pre, you know, kind of the ADU concepts that I know uh, Mayor Garcetti's administration had rolled out to try and help accelerate, um, where do we stand in terms of, uh, generally speaking, uh, the utilization and, uh, and the construction? Because I think, you know, there's a couple of things, the way that I, the, kind of the, the climate that we're in right now is that um, obviously the pre-design and kind of to the, the kit of parts, if you will, is going to uh, make it easier for a lot of families to opt to do this. But I also still think that we're talking about some, you know, the upfront costs in the pre-design are frankly some of the biggest obstructions to much of this. Um, but in the end, I think we're gonna be our own worst enemy because we're, what we're gonna create is frankly more folks, I would be interested in frankly seeing the data because I would suggest uh, anyone building an ADU in Venice and Silver Lake and some of these areas, they're gonna be Airbnbs. I don't think they're gonna be rented for all of these purposes to be quite honest uh, because there's more risk in being a landlord. That's a fact. So, um, so I, you know, look, I hope it works. We gotta throw everything at these problems. Um, but I'm really curious as to, uh, I, and I believe I had introduced a motion evaluating, in fact, even the construction of ADUs uh, or the permitting of uh, the, the construction permits for ADUs given some of, the, uh, some of the policy adoptions that we have. There's always adverse impacts to every decision that we make. Uh, but this, this is one where I think, yes, it's a great idea, sure, let's, let's try it. Uh, but I think in practical terms for an average household, and you know, we have more average households than the 1% that live in the hillsides. Uh, the reality is, is that we're gonna have a dynamic that I think still does not fully incent uh, the construction of these much needed units. Yes. And those are all excellent points. Um, the one point I'll make, and then I'm gonna hand it over to my colleagues, is one of the things that we are proposing as part of the construction financing program is to have a grant available for those pre-development costs. Mm -hmm. I, saw, I saw that in the report. Yeah. So I saw, and that's a $40,000. Yes. So what is the average pre-development cost though based on, based on experience, I think, you know, average, whatever average looks like. What are, what are we talking about? I will ask my colleagues to respond. And I think we have to come back with that. Okay. Because I know, you know, I had introduced, for example, um, one of, I had introduced a motion with respect to ADUs because we have a lot of um, properties, for example, that are zero lot lines based on, uh, you know, we, ha we have, uh, when I uh, introduced the motion for, um, to basically, we looked at a lot of those, you know, very old properties. Uh, we had a circumstance where people had to go through a complete reconstruction of their garage, for example, because it wasn't technically in compliance because it was built in the 1900s on a zero lot line, uh, to all of a sudden have to get it re-permitted or get it 
you know, permitted as a garage, then to go through the process of permitting, uh, going, you know, for an ADU, which was like, it's ridiculous. We know that they're already, we're just trying to, uh, we're, we're doing, uh, we're doing double the work and, and doubling the expense. And so, we, you know, obviously working with uh, building and safety, we've changed a lot of those rules, which was great, uh, and providing that, uh, that, um, that opportunity for folks to pursue that. I'm just always curious about, in practicality, you know, what do the real numbers look like? The financing terms, I think, you know, for those that have the equity that would be will willing to do it, I don't know if the terms are gonna be substantially more, uh, you know, more of an incentive uh, given what we're doing. I just wonder, honestly, uh, are they willing to sign up to those terms and limit themselves to who they could rent to when, frankly, we make it really impossible to be a landlord in the city. So I just, I'm curious about the numbers in terms of given some of the policy decisions that this council has adopted, what the real actual implications are for some of those decisions. We so do I'm, have, oh, I'm sorry. So I was just gonna suggest that I think those are excellent points and the big question here is will people take this, right? Will they right. take the incentive? So you could always, once the contractor is selected on the construction financing, you could always set a limit to see what happens in six months, what happens in a year. Mm -hmm. Because we have had, I mean, they've been, there have been nonprofits who have tried to start ADU programs right. with low-income homeowners, and they haven't been successful. Right. So you can provide a time limit and say, come back in six months, come back in, in a year, if there are no takers, so if you have two takers, then maybe we should invest the money in you know multifamily housing right. or or yeah, home ownership or something else because you know it is going to be challenging for homeowners to want to take government money with all the restrictions that come with it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now it's uh, anyways. Uh, thank you. I, I listened. It, these are these are policy. You're living with the consequences, and we're living with the consequences of policies that have been adopted. I just ask these questions because I know there's direct and real implications for what those decisions are. And I think we have to be really reflective of, you know, are we potentially incenting more of an environment, uh, for, you know, again, for a multitude of reasons, we're exhausting whatever uh, possible short-term, uh, you know, uh, travel uh, places for folks that are visiting Los Angeles, we're, you know, we're mass acquisition uh, for our homeless population. So we're gonna, it, something's gonna give. And you know, it's gonna have real and long-term implications, uh, but I, I just, I'm, I'm worried about uh, what, what we end up creating or, or whether or not it's actually an incentive given some of the challenges being a landlord, so. Thank you. But I appreciate that. The, sir, um, can we just move to Mr. Harris Dawson? Thank you uh, so much, um, and thank you for you all's work on this uh, project, I uh, appreciate uh, Ms. Rodriguez's comments about being a landlord. This goes back to our last discussion, which I think you all were in the room for. We just talked about a landlord who isn't even meeting with the city face to face. They have lawyers meeting with the city and then they have people going over W-9s and they have a whole setup to do this where an individual landowner doesn't have any of that. Uh, and so the idea that they would be put in a position to have to contend in that way is untenable for most people who uh, know anything about the process and that's why I, I will continue to be on a crusade uh, that we not treat small landlords and small landowners the way we treat the, all the multinational corporations tripping over themselves to be landlords in the city of LA so that's a side my question about this is uh, I, I this is genuine curiosity and I, I wonder if you all have thoughts about it my district and a lot of South LA and I think a lot of other parts of the city, the, the, the main topography in my district is, the, 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 the most common household in my district is a single African American woman over 75 with a three bedroom house with a gar detached garage, a front yard and a backyard. Perfect candidates for ADUs. One of the challenges though is, besides all the things Ms. Ms. Rodriguez pointed out, which I think are right on point, is redlining. So redlining is one of those things that's never official. 
Like it's never written. The banks follow the letter of the law, but people can't get loans. And the, where we saw it um, in, in a way that some people would think was positive is, you know, my district borders Inglewood. So Inglewood has all these stadiums. So a bunch of people wanted to go do ADUs. Well, a lot of them had to get their loan from Airbnb. Hmm. Because even though they had equity, the bank would not make them a loan to do, th to do an ADU, even though they were walking distance from SoFi Stadium. Um, so I'm just wondering, how does this program avoid that, given that you're partnering with the regular banks that engage in these practices and doing that? And, and for me, that's the reason why you end up with a bunch of ADUs in some places and not in others. It's not because people don't want them, it's because they go to get the financing and there's, they find some reason, some legitimate reason to say no. Yeah, I, absolutely an incredibly important point and something that has to be part of our procurement effort for the lending partner for this and that we need to be leveraging the fact that the city is putting dollars into this program for particular households to ensure that that isn't occurring. I'm not gonna pretend it's an easy problem to solve or it would have been solved already. Um, but I think it is one that we have to be committed to solving and having as part of this program, especially at the pilot stage, so we can figure out how to make it work and how to scale it if it is an appropriate program to continue. So, so what, what might an intervention look like? Like what, what tools, or the tools that you all feel comfortable sharing in, on the public record, what, what, that, what might that look like? Well, I think if the, if the RFP is going to be for the selection of a lender partner, the lender partner would have to be willing to provide the financing for the construction. So that's one of the reasons with it, when the housing department raised the issue of CDFIs, our question was, why only CDFI? And what we were told was that CDFIs have received grants from the state or loans from the state of California to incent the construction of ADUs. So just the fact that a, that a lender partner is going to respond to the RFP would be they are willing to put up the money, leverage the LHD money for the construction loan on the ADU so that the homeowner wouldn't have to worry about the construction loan. They don't have to go to their private bank, right? They would go to the CDFI or the, you know, through this program, however the housing department sets it up, but the selected loan partner would have to be able to be willing to provide that capital, whether it's a bank or a CDFI. And, and I do think what we would need to come back with is detailed provisions on what we would include in the RFP to make sure that that is something that we feel comfortable is going to, we collectively feel comfortable can be achieved through the selection of the lending partner. Well, thank you. I would love to uh, continue to hear more about that as you all develop it. I, I, you know, I'll just note, uh, Madam Chair, with your permission, parenthetically, this is an editorial comment. <laughs> when we say we're going to have a CDFI do it, a CDFI is a government intervention. Mm -hmm. So basically, we're taking one government intervention and putting it on top of another inter government intervention, and the private sector is never held accountable mm -hmm. for this activity, so I, I just, I just think this is a place, and I don't know the. I say this as someone who doesn't know the answers. I just think we could use some creativity in this and regard. We don't, we don't recommend limiting it to CDFIs ultimately, um, and and you're you're right, Councilman. But we need to think really intentionally about this in the in the RFP process to challenge challenge the lenders, and that again gets to breadth of terms to really push them. Um, uh, in, in different directions, and that's also why this conversation is really helpful, uh, because it's, it's I, I think it's, a valid point. I think it's worth, it's a point uh, well taken, that we can do more than just create our own programs, that we can actually liaise with the private sector to identify exactly the challenges that you're both bringing up in terms of lending, and, and be specific about the kinds of products that we're asking for. I mean, I feel like we hear from private financial institutions all the time that are looking to make interventions in Los Angeles about the housing crisis, why not ask them to develop a product that's for this based on the knowledge and expertise that you've already developed in running this program? It just feels like such a win-win-win um, intervention and something that I think we and the departments could really do. So I'm, I'm yeah. hopeful that we can do that coming out of this discussion. Ms. Rodriguez? Oh, we're sorry, were you done, Mr. Yeah, Harris-Dawson? And, and, and I would love to see some investigation about this um, in terms of in terms of the reasons why people don't 
uh, pursue it um, because I think it's it it's meaningful for more than just this program. And I'll just j just to use the Airbnb and the lodging example that Ms. Rodriguez uh, laid out. So so what's happening in my district is people aren't building ADUs for the stadium and all these other things. You know what's happening is investors are just buying the whole house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not just do you not have the ADU, now you don't even have the house because right. the house is being used for, for um, tenancy, for tourism. So I, I, again, these things, these are like dominoes and if, if we can just pull one or two of them out, we can stop the whole uh, thing from falling and landing in the lap of the city where our resident, residents and voters are upset with us because we can't seem to solve basic problems. So yeah. I did want to also note that one of the things the housing department could do is talk to the secondary market. So Fannie Mae, and that's yes. actually in the LHD report, has a loan product that provides for ADU financing. Right. And so partnering with the secondary market so that the banks that they, you know, actually buy loans from can then invest in this type of program is one way we could get them to partner. I would add also, council member, that I think one of the challenges for low-income homeowners to build ADUs is just the entire process. Mm -hmm. And I guess I can say I went through the ADU process mm -hmm. and it was a nightmare for me. And I, so I thought if it was hard for me, how, you know, and I sort of know how the city process works and it took about a year and a half, maybe longer for the whole process, you know, how is someone gonna do it that doesn't speak the language or doesn't have some support? Mm -hmm. And I think if we were able to, f you know, finance that part of it where someone is actually guiding like an expert contractor, the homeowner, because that's where the most critical part is, right? Someone that can guide them through the permitting process, through the construction process, and to ensure that their contractor is doing you know, a good job on their ADU is critical because I can tell you I had to fire my first contractor. That's just so. So I know how incredibly difficult this is, and I think that would be one of the ch major challenges for homeowners. Great, thank you, Ms. Chavez. You're in the city of LA, and you did that. Yes. Okay. Good. Good note. I'm, I'm thinking about building one myself. So. <laughs> okay, Ms. Rodriguez. Final remarks. Well, Ms. Chavez spoken like someone who worked at HUD, right? So you know all about uh, the the back end of the market really well. I think, you know, again, in terms of the CDFIs, much if not all of their funding is derived from uh, those primary large scale uh, uh, banking industry folks uh, that are looking for these CDFIs to offer those micro business or, you know, those micro loans that, uh, that they wouldn't otherwise finance. Um, you know, I just, Having lived through 2008 and the subprime market and everything else, I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of fear, and and rightfully so. Um, so I'm really I'm, I'm eager to see what our actual numbers like look like for the starts. Um, but the other thing I wanted to request in the report back is, you know, one of the areas, and and no one's talked about this because we talk about when people end up in homelessness or they're in the low income circumstances. But the reality is, and for many Latino, fam for many uh, immigrant families, you're talking about multi-generational housing. The origination of an ADU was a granny flat. And there, you know, they called it a granny flat for a reason. And it was because you needed to, you know, when, when your family, when, uh, when folks are getting elderly and, you know, you, your grandma can't live uh, alone anymore, you move them in, with you and you know you don't have the space needs well we have the circumstance given the high cost of living for a lot of families a lot of uh, middle-income families uh, with their kids returning from college and they're you know they're they're living at home and so I don't want to also narrowly limit this conversation to the idea that we're you know we have to wait for folks to be in dire circumstances we also just have an immense housing shortage uh, that we should create an easier pathway for families to just, you know, construct the space that would enable them to provide for their very own household. That we all know expands. I mean, you know, it's like, I love my kids. I'd love them to, you know, be able to do it on their own. But the reality is, is that far, you know, fewer and fewer uh, young adults are able to go off and do that. 
And so let's not lose the nuclear family and the, you know, the uh, young adult children of those families that are also looking to somewhat straddle some independence or perhaps they, you know, then uh, are growing their families, but their opportunities are limited as well. That was always, you know, that's, that's always another pathway that, it, that I don't want us to forget about um, because, like I said, we can, we can talk about all these idealized ways of us trying to do that. I think, for me, it's the pre-development grant, I think, is a great incentive. Um, but I also know, to your point, you've got some unscrupulous contractors uh, and, you know, for, for the folks that have the ability to do it because they perhaps have the lot, the lot size in order to accommodate it, it might still be very prohibitive. It's just, it's one of those things, I, you know, that I, I just, I know those practical experiences. I always go back to my dad, uh, you know, he wanted to rent our childhood home and then the tenants really took advantage and started uh, subleasing additional rooms in the house and he says, to hell with this, I'm selling the house. And so what are we doing? We're then incenting more of the corpor corporatized home ownership model because let's be honest, we've made it impossible for mom and pops to rent in this city. And so we, you know, we're, that's, that, that is the outcome. It's, it's uh, an incentive for the corporatization of housing. Uh, there's mass consolidations that are happening every day. It's not just in the banking industry, it's with our housing stock as well. And so we just have to recognize that. So, you know, I, uh, I, I look forward to uh, more of this coming back. I think I would not limit ourselves though to, I, again, I recognize the idealized, but I also know the reality of, of uh, what the environment is, but appreciate all of your insight and your own personal sacrifice of going through the ADU process, uh, Ms. Chavez. Hey. I, I was gonna just share, we do have some statistics in, in answer to your question, Ms. Councilmember Rodriguez. Um, from 2007, the, in the Planning Department's quarterly housing progress report, uh, from 2017 to 2021, 18,893 permits were issued to build or legalize ADUs, and 9,988 uh, COOs were issued for completed ADUs. So half. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's half. And so how much money was expended in only fulfilling half? And that's the other part of the conversation that we have to talk about is Ms. Chavez, like, not everyone is in the same financial circumstances, and so they endeavor to do this. It takes a lot of financial commitment to go into it, and what if you're losing your shirt doing it, okay? And then you're all of a sudden putting yourself in a, in a circumstance where you've perhaps exhausted some of your equity. You know, some people have the means to go out and build an ADU, and if they get a bad contractor, they can string it along, it's no problem, because they have the financial means to do it. Most people in the city do not. Yes. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna hear um, this report w again, right? So we're gonna have an update to, that will reconcile some of the challenges that were mentioned up top. So you'll bring it back to committee at the next committee meeting. Hopefully we won't have to discuss it again. I think we'll just be able to review it and um, move it along to the full council. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, it's 5.30 now, um, and we still had a presentation from LASA about data that we were hoping to get through today, but wanted to ask committee members about their schedules. LASA's, but you gotta go. And you gotta go. And I think Mr. Lee's already gone. And Ms. Rodriguez has to go. And I have seen the presentation from LASA and I appreciate the data and the new um, tools that they're bringing to the table. Everyone has the printout of the new data dashboards that they're uh, presenting. Um, I was, one of the challenges has been that we, um, I think we've been asking a lot from LASA, but sometimes when they do bring more data to the table, I, I wanna make sure that this committee and all members of it are fully engaged with the data that they're bringing to the table and fully engaged with some of the improvements that they are making. So I'm gonna ask that we continue this to the next committee meeting. 
um, and have it be presented first so that uh, we can have a full discussion with all members present at the next meeting. And apologies to LASA um, staff who've waited patiently um, for this meeting. And is there anything else on the agenda? Items 14 and 15. Items 14 and 15, these are the uh, Inside Safe reports. Are there questions about the Inside Safe reports for this cycle from committee members? Do you have questions about the Inside Safe reports? Did, did we buy the Mayfair? Hmm? Did we actually buy the Mayfair yet? Yeah. That's the only did question. We have, the, did, have we bought the Mayfair is the question. Is the Mayor's office even here to answer questions? It's 5.30. I think they were prepared to answer questions earlier, but yeah. Oh, so yeah. they're not working anymore? Okay. That's the only All right, I, guess we're I don't know. All right, so um, for those items, I think we will, um, I guess we'll continue those items as well and bring them back to committee for the next meeting. Okay, with that, uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>